exclamation point right there. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. Room on the SEC defensive team before he got to Auburn. He was at Moorhead State, was the OBC defensive player of the year. Nice spin and finish. Tonight, Broom's got eight. He is carrying this Auburn team. 365 Sports is presented by IdealMRI.com. High-quality MRIs for $497 or less. IdealMRI.com. Your health is important. So is your budget. Fakes on the jump shot. He can elevate here. Crowd. Doesn't get the bounce. They don't get back. Danger runs the floor, which he does well. And Danger finishes. 365 Sports is also brought to you by Texas Farm Bureau Insurance, protecting Texans since 1952. Horn again playing with four fouls. 21 points tonight for State. Takes a bump and hits. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? Search 365 Sports on YouTube. Brought to you by TFNB, your bank for life. Shellstad launching deep. And Shellstad buries a three. 365 Sports is turbocharged by Unite Private Networks. Find out more at UnitePrivateNetworks.com. Nice give back, and Jones flushes. Wells and Jones. Now, here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. And here we go with 365 Sports on YouTube. And also, we don't say it enough, but also remember there is the Sikkim 365 app that's available. I used it, in fact, when I was on the road last week, late last week, and kind of be able to listen into a few of the things that were going on and hope you've had a really good day. And I don't know how many of you went to bed early. If you were watching Virginia basketball, you probably did. We're going to get into that in just a moment. But a couple of notes first. Craig Smoke and Paul Catalina. I'm David Smoke. Thank you for your time. A couple of basketball notes on injuries of two players that have been battling the injuries. Jack McKenzie was at the Scott Drew media session earlier today as they get ready for the NCAA tournament with Colgate on Friday morning. Langston Love been in and out. Just cannot get a break. Out this weekend. Whether Baylor plays once and or twice. Doubtful for the tournament per Scott Drew earlier today. And on top of that, yesterday evening, this story came down. Bill Self meeting with the media outside the practice facility at KU, saying that Kevin McCuller, Jr., out, not just for the game coming up this week, but out for the tournament. There's been a lot of back and forth on that. Let's discuss, first of all, Langston Love. It's almost as if Baylor's used to him not playing, with all due respect. Yeah, um, and this is, Langston Love is not as big of a loss for Baylor as Kevin McCullough is for Kansas because Baylor has depth. Uh, but I do think that Langston Love has affected Jacoby Walter a little bit because if you see the, the longer that – Langston Love hasn't played. The more pressure has been on Jacoby Walter as a freshman, and his shooting percentage has gone down because the rotations just aren't the same. So uh, maybe this time off is, is going to kind of help that. Not playing in the Big 12 uh, will probably help that, at least in the first uh, round uh, for Baylor. But it's huge if he's not going to be there for the tournament because I would think that if you want to make any kind of deep run, that would be very, very, very tough without – your sixth man, which is who Langston Love is, and the fact that he was double-digit points off the bench every single night. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a tough blow, no doubt about it, for Scott Drew and the Bears. I mean, that's a guy that you were uh, really hoping to rely on and, and help carry you through this dance, and I guess what uh, injured it in practice, I guess, are aggravated and uh, still just cannot... Uh, He's tried to come back twice and both times could not really finish. Yeah, just yeah. cannot get over the hump as far as that injury goes. So, I mean, they didn't rule him out for the entire postseason. So, if you want to look at it as optimistically as possible, there is that. Uh, so, get through this first weekend and then see what happens. But, yeah, this is not the news that you wanted to see. And I still feel okay about their chances, but all of a sudden... 
you do uh, look at maybe that second game a little bit differently. That first one, I think you still feel like you've got the weapons in place to to be able to win that one. But, you know, the deeper you go, the harder it gets. And so, yeah, that's uh, not the news that you wanted here today with uh, the first game of the tournament looming. We will also get into um, Tom Izzo taking pot shots at the mid-majors. The college football playoff a lot better for Washington State and Oregon State than we thought maybe on Friday. And then also Nebraska has an AD, Washington looking for one, and there's a lot more to get to when it comes to football, including the latest on the SEC schedule in two years, Jaden Proctor and what's going on there. But now let's get to Caden. Virginia. What did I say? Jaden Proctor? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you yeah. said Caden. No, no. Uh, Jaden Proctor Jayden. and what's going on with no, that. No, Caden Proctor. Caden Proctor and what's going on with that. Now, Virginia basketball. Uh, I don't know if you watched any of it. If you did, you might as well have just taken either Valium or just sleeping pills. Missed 24 shots in the first half, including their last 14. Indiana State had six full games this season when it missed 24 or fewer shots. Now, again, it's time to move on. The tournament has started, but my God, this was there's a lot of argument about Virginia. They are done. And they won the national title that will always have the national title, and that's what a lot of teams would give up 10 years of drought for a national title. But are they like the Iowa of football and basketball? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, it's exactly – that's a great comparison. And unlike Iowa, at least Tony Bennett has uh, publicly said last night we may have to change our approach to this. It worked for the team that he had that won the national title. But – Emory pointed out that Jay Billis said to you just yesterday he'd rather have offense than defense. Yep. And the game has changed a lot in a very short amount of time with what people are doing. And and basketball is is probably their cycles run a lot faster than football. You know, you can you can have the option for 25 years. You can have the spread for 25 years. And then like 10 years from now, there's gonna be a new thing we can't even think of that's out there. People are like, oh my gosh, this is wild. This offense that happens. Basketball's just run in cycles. Basically, depending on where, okay, is there are there more guards now? What are the rules like? You know, what are the defenses that we can play, and how people cycle through that? So those cycles spin a lot faster. And he won an old school defensive way uh, in 2019, and good for Virginia. But he didn't adapt his style at all, and they just kind of get further and further away from that team. Because it's harder and harder to find five elite defenders who can score, and then when everybody around you is is trying to score more and they're shooting more threes, well, if your whole thing is, you know, we're, we don't really have to score that much, it's going to be a problem. And scoring 14 points and a half was absolutely disgraceful, and I'm sure the committee is, you know, going, uh, maybe we whiffed on that one. I, I don't know if they are, but that, yeah. you know, you wonder if they even care that well. I just they think this will be solved when they add more teams. <laughs> Yeah, yeah no. that was most of the theme last night, Craig, is that most people are, yeah, yeah but we need another 8 to 12 teams added to the tournament. Yeah, no, I don't I don't think we do. I don't think we've, we've needed that whatsoever. I don't think Virginia's the poster child for why that shouldn't happen either, but it is an easy way to point and go. So you want more teams like this that were fringe that probably shouldn't have made it, but now they're going to just get in because there's eight more spots that are available um, like Oklahoma obviously would be in. They probably would have put up a better performance in Virginia. But, I mean, we've seen Virginia play like this. I mean, this is nothing brand new unless you've just never watched them before. Um, and, yeah, that was horrific. Uh, 14 points at halftime. High school basketball games have higher scores than that. And high school basketball, in my opinion, is not a great product to watch most of the time. So, oh, yeah. Um, that yeah, that was not pretty uh, whatsoever and uh, not a, a game that I think – the, the basketball folks out there will point to as one of the better examples of how beautiful the game is. So, yeah, just a, an awful showing when you saw the videos of them so surprised to get the announcement in the first place, start to circulate of, well, no wonder they were surprised as anybody that they even got the opportunity to get in there. And that turned out to be the highlight of their postseason because they turned around and put up this performance and exited so quickly. But yeah, that was horrific. Congrats to Colorado State. I mean, a team that probably doesn't get enough credit here um, because we're so busy dunking on Virginia, but uh, they certainly proved themselves and proved, if anything, they should have been a no doubter, whereas Virginia should have had a little bit more questions about them. But uh, yeah, that. That's the kind of showing that uh, sets basketball back. So, uh, Garrett, do you have that one? Michigan yes. State basketball coach Tom Izzo took a lot of heat because he was making comments about the tournament going forward and 
Chris Vanini, who's going to join us at 340 on many things, said he was reading the full quote. And a lot of times people will see a quote or part of a quote or even someone who just takes something and then they put it in their own words about the, uh, the mid-majors and Cinderella and all of that. He said, reading the full quote, we'll show you in a minute, is those comments today got a bit misconstrued. Here's one of what of things he said. I'm a Division II guy. This is Izzo. You know, I, I'm always looking out for the little guys. I'm not very big myself. I always have an appreciation maybe that would be a reason to expand. I just think what's happening now, everybody likes the upsets in the first weekend, but I'm not so sure moving on. That's what's best for the game. I think it's got to be looked at seriously. He compared the difference between football with one-third the schools compared to basketball with 350-plus. And he's just kind of wondering about it. He took a tremendous amount of heat, and in some cases probably should, about saying that, yeah, the first weekend's fun, but in the end it all calms down. Florida, Atlantic, and by the way, San Diego State would like to disagree with you. Yeah, and I think that uh, that was why I was shocked like that the morning after Virginia you know, scored less than a convent last night uh, yeah. that, they, that they go, <laughs> and he goes and says that, like all the other things he said. Fine. Well, you throw that in there and it's going to be either misconstrued or take it like this is this is the disconnect that we see between the power brokers and the fans, the fans of this event who are very loyal to it. Have told you we love this thing just the way it is. We don't need more. We don't want less. This is so perfect. You guys have actually Instead of in your monkeys humping a doorknob way, found a way to do something that's so wonderful. Don't mess with it. And all they're doing is, I want to mess with it. I want to mess with it. I want to mess with it. Listen to the consumer. They're telling you, don't mess with this it. is a perfect meal. It's, it's a five-star steakhouse. Don't mess with it. One of the other things, Craig, that he's talking about is that the tournament championships and all of that, you know, Purdue loses, uh, so they don't get an automatic bid, but it's not like they're going to be left out. But he was just kind of barking. It's kind of what – Patino wasn't barking. I thought he handled what happened to Louisville on Sunday night very well. St. It's, John's. It's, uh, what did I say? St. John. Louisville. St. John's, excuse me. And uh, and and so there's, there's Izzo on I, – I like the little guys – but I think sometimes we're so worried about that first week, we forget about the entire the game itself, the rest of the tournament. So I'll come at it from a different angle because uh, I know that there were a lot of, it was like 100% Michigan State fans that were saying this got misconstrued and that the quote wasn't, or the tweet wasn't really fully fleshing out the quote. And so does it make sense if you position it that um, he was saying more of, when you have these smaller conferences that have their tournaments and the team that actually is like the most deserving to be in the tournament gets knocked out in like mm -hmm. the championship game and this other team who probably is not making the tournament is suddenly in the tournament and right. now this other team that should have been in all along now is yeah. got to get in or is on the bubble. I think that's kind of what he was pointing to as well. Well, yeah. but the, then would he be okay with those mid-major conferences getting multiple bids? Probably not. That's why you expand the tournament there so everybody go. gets – does yeah. that make sense? But I yeah. thought they wanted to expand the tournament. The feeling I get based on Sankey is expand the tournament, but it's going to be expanding the tournament to add more of the power – yeah. Autonomy to, conferences. It's to include Oklahoma yeah. and Virginia and whatever, but I'm just saying that's the only other way that they're also going to get mm -hmm. their other team in if there is an upset in the right. championship right. game. So that's kind of how I read his quote and how I digested it was uh, putting, I guess, so much on that conference championship, it, it can, if there's an upset, really shake up and suddenly screw with the spots a little bit. And so a team that might be deserving – doesn't get in because this seed upset the the top seed that was going to get that automatic berth. And like so an I, Indiana State. Screwed, like an yeah. Indiana State got yeah. screwed. Yeah, exactly. So in an expanded format, Oklahoma gets in. But you know what? Indiana State probably would too, you would think. Mm -hmm. um, even though I know what you're saying is they're gearing it towards the big brands, and I agree. But I don't think that means there's not going to be any mid majors that would make it in an expanded format. That would be silly. So I think that's how I read it, or more of how I took it in. I understand though the backlash to reading the initial quote, and and then you know some of that could be in reinforced depending on the way you read the article. But but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt as best I can, just to play devil's advocate. And if that's where he's coming from, I can understand it a bit more than the way it originally appeared, which certainly made him look 
pretty bad. I yep. mean, in the in the grand scheme, the conference tournaments, just like the conference championship games, are there not to find out who makes the tournament. It's there because of money, just like in football. Yeah. Here's a note, and I, um, Garrett, I hope you, you may have blacked out uh, his uh, actual name, but that's let's have fun with this, Mister Hotballs. The people who put Virginia in the NCAA tournament should all. So be put in an electric chair. Like, don't be offended. Don't go crazy. Yeah. I had to show that because that's kind of the way most people felt last night as that thing just dragged on for a couple of hours or so. Yeah. Um, and look, uh, we, we all could use, uh, you know, a name like Mr. Hotballs uh, as our as Is our that your nickname, Paul? No, it was Don't they call you off, <laughs> off TV? No. That's my, listen, I'm mad, really mad because he's ruined my whole idea for an OnlyFans page. Yeah, there you but go. <laughs> I, I think that uh, what you saw last night was the argument against the expansion of the tournament. I, I think that it's, it's as big as it can be. And because if you do that, now not that you're going to get a team scoring 14 points and a half again, but you're going to get more games like that that no one cares about. So why are you doing it more? And if you're not doing it to make sure that the Indiana States get in for sure, because like that's one of the things that's a selling point to like, well, Indiana State wouldn't have had to worry about it this year. And then you go, well, I mean, wouldn't they? It's the same thing with football. Like, hey, uh, you know, the ACC wouldn't have to worry about getting left out of playoff because we're going to give them one spot for sure. Well, once you fill their little spot, is there any is there any promise from the committee that you're really going to stick up for the little ones? You say that because it's all that you can throw the line to the mid-majors and the G5 schools and, and the like, but really, you don't care. Yeah, you, you act, and at least it seems like the, the momentum is about – separating from the highest level from the mid or lower levels and yet you know they that's all they have that's the only way they're going to get in because there will be some mid majors and then Jay Billis brought this up too yesterday with us is that if you did not give all of the conferences who play college basketball at the division one level an automatic bid there would be a hot handful of those conferences who would have never have somebody in and then it becomes the football model I think this is what well, we need to Make sure and, uh, I guess, hammer home that football and basketball are two very different yeah. things. But one of the arguments I've already seen crop up, and this is, I think, very concerning for college sports fandom and just kind of the industry in general, for those who don't pop like 3 million ratings every time their TV's on uh, or their teams are on TV, is some of the pushback to adding more of those types of teams, more of the mid major teams. Um, and the reasoning for bringing in more of like, let's just put Oklahoma in. Do they deserve it in this current format? No. An expanded one, though, they'd be included. And this team would be included. And that team would be included. It's for TV ratings. And you know what? F the TV ratings, man. Like, I, I bring them up during the season, which I'm probably going to stop doing because I just think it's look, interesting to look at like who, not not in a tribal way, but just like, hey, who watched the, the games this weekend and what game popped the biggest ratings and that's just just another way to say this is yeah. how much bigger I am it's like you. man look yeah. at that freaking crowd at Ohio State Michigan and then look at the the massive number they got and I look at it just in that way very simply but I'm already seeing that chatter kind of rise up in regards to the NCAA tournament of yeah FAU is great but who cares look at the TV ratings they got by the time the championship rolled around it's like dude you as an average fan give a damn about the TV rating what was the Why? Most, what was the recent championship where people brought up the ratings and how low it would be rather than just the game itself. There was something that happened recently on that. Uh, maybe it was a college football playoff. I don't know, but those were two. Pretty I don't know. Maybe games. TCU or something. I, I don't know. But um, yeah, there, there's the FAU example, TCU playing Georgia. I mean, there's, there's, I guess, been other instances as well. But, I mean, I, I understand the network's worrying about that. And I guess the, the fans who do worry about that are uh, speaking for – the group that doesn't really watch at all until March and, you know, let's do what's best for getting as many eyeballs as we can in March. And, you know, I understand that business wise to an extent, but I'll never understand fans wanting to include, you know, 75 teams just so there's potentially better TV ratings in a round of 32 game for CBS. Like who cares? I mean, yeah. what the data enough or maybe water it down to where you might lose actually a little bit of that. I mean, maybe, and maybe not. And I think that's the gamble we're seeing with the sec and the big 10 that they're banking on is in football. 
And again, football is a very different sport, but they're banking on the fact that like, okay, if Iowa State's not involved, does that really change anything for us? No, not really, because Ole Miss will pop this rating if they got the same spot. And so from a TV rating standpoint, they're sort of locked in where all of those biggest football brands are under two umbrellas. And basketball, it's a much different thing. I mean, you can't say the Big 12 is this lowly little conference when it comes to basketball. You can't say that most of the time when it comes to the ACC, but you can dunk on them in football over and over again, you know, granted – the, the timing and, and the given year and all that. So, yeah, I mean, if that's that's part of the, the conversation, then that's just unfortunate because it's just another sign of – and, look, this has always been a money, money, money industry, but ruining a good thing or, or temp, tampering with a good thing just for the sake of getting more eyeballs on a, a game that not many people are going to remember in the long run for bigger brands, I, I don't know. I, I don't I like think, that idea. I think all this you're talking about all started because of realignment. Of course. I think yeah. it all started, but think about it. It's, it doesn't mean that the, you didn't say something back in 2015, but a lot of it has started because it's kind of like this turf war. And Whoa. this is what, and, and instead of how many times we, did you hear like comments about the ratings instead of the damn game? That's, well, that's the part that kind of got to me a little bit. Why does everybody suddenly want expanded playoff or expanded tournament? Because they've got 18 teams in their leagues now. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. That's why if you had 10 or 12 and, Okay, you get like six, and that's great. It's 50% of the league. Six now is a third of the league. Yep. It might be a fourth of the league here in the next two or three years. So I think that's where, yeah, you're having to kind of force more of that to let everybody eat more, but it's because you've all consolidated, and, and now you've got way more mouths to feed under a conference umbrella. All right, so late last week, the college football playoff, it was announced that uh, they had come up with an agreement on the distribution model for the teams that would have a chance to make money which is everybody in uh, what is FBS football from the G uh, uh, from the group of five all the way up to SEC and Big Ten, and then there was that question about Oregon State, Washington State that didn't make any sense to me. I was like, "There's no way that's true." So let's go to uh, Murphy, the president at Oregon State, an improved distribution of the CFP revenues has been agreed upon to better reflect the excellence of Oregon State's and Washington State's athletic programs and the strength and support of our alumni and fans. Great leadership from the Pac-12 and Teresa Gould, who's the commissioner, who replaced Klyovkov. Then we understand why she's saying this. Remember, there was initially the report that they would get guaranteed $350,000 each. Which never, like, it, that even bothered me over the weekend a couple of times while I was trying to just chill out. Ross Stellinger, Pac-12 has negotiated an amended distribution for Oregon State, Washington State, $3.6 million each annually for 26, 27, and 28, up from the original figure that was $350,000 that, again, never made sense. So at least now, this makes sense, good for them, and now it's a lot bigger it's 100%. Well, it would be 100% bigger. No, I don't know if that's yeah, right. It's definitely yeah, 100% bigger. 350K I mean, to 3.6 <laughs> million. It's, it's, it's good way. for them getting that done. I don't know where it's that like extra. 10 times bigger. That's, a, that's another $7 million or maybe almost that that was taken from somewhere else. I don't know where. But that makes sense and good for those two no, schools. No one's going to the poorhouse because Oregon State and, and Washington State are taken care of. Now, there is a detail in that that um, – it makes me interested about what UConn's future is because mm -hmm. they they were treating them as independents, so they're paying them like independents except for Notre Dame, who has that larger share because they're Notre Dame. Well, UConn gets $350,000 because they're the last remaining football independent that's not Notre Dame, as everyone else has now joined a conference. So, man, like UConn – like. Do they have cooties or something that there's not at least one conference willing to to throw them a bone to get them in there? Remember the reaction from this show, whether it's from us or those who yeah. watched this show during all that, who's going to be added and UConn's name was brought up and I think that was floated out there or socialized and everybody, I would think, nine out of every ten people were like, no, on UConn. In fact, I got well, even some texts from I, people in, in athletics that were like, no. But, but that, that, I'm not saying to the Big 12. I'm just talking about the... In general, There's yeah. not a conference that would want them for football that's out there, like the MAC or something? Like, Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I totally get your point there. I mean, first of all, good for Washington State and Oregon State. Uh, that's great news for them. And, uh, you know, we'll see um, how they go about their future moves. It's, it's going to be fascinating because uh, there's no real sturdy 
I guess, end point. Everything's so up in the air for them. Do they rebuild the conference after a couple of years? Do they join another conference after a couple of years? What do those conferences look like? Do they go rejoin Stanford and Cal and the ACC? Um, and what does the ACC appear to be by the point that that would be uh, feasible? Um, you, you know, I mean, there's there's different ways that this could go, and, and I have no idea where it ends. I, I know that it seems like Washington State and Oregon State seem to have – a good head on their shoulders and some good leadership guiding them. Obviously, uh, Teresa Gould play a, a, a role here and helping get their money. So not sure how it came about, but it's fantastic news for them because seeing that initial figure, you were thinking like, how in the world is this going to be sustainable? Even with the big boatload of money that you're going to be getting, but just moving forward, it was more of not even, a, it, was, it was a money thing to some extent. It was also though just the perception, right? Of like, this is how you're perceived is this is how much, you're worth and and not more than that. And so I think that was part of the, the blow to the ego as well uh, for those two. But now it's been changed for the better. And so great for, for them, like I said. But yeah, with UConn, I just think it's one thing if you're talking basketball, guys, but all of a sudden, yeah, now you get to travel to stores to play football. It's like, does anybody really want to do that if they don't have to? I, I don't think so. That's not a knock on UConn. It's just when you're talking about Colorado or Arizona – not that those are the biggest brands in the world, but there's at least some familiarity or it's a power school j jumping over. When you're a league that had already added a Houston and a UCF and a BYU and a Cincinnati, the idea of them going and adding a UConn, I mean, what are you looking at financially? You're already going down money per team or maybe little bumps, uh, but I just don't know how that doesn't just water you down because as good as the basketball brands might be, the football is a slog, and I don't know that that is offset by hoops in terms of what they could uh, add financially. So, yeah, it's a, it's a weird spot that they're in, but they'll certainly, because of those basketball programs, be a, a team that will be very interesting to watch moving forward. Uh, the commissioner now of the Pac-12, too, Teresa Gould, has done more in a short amount of time than it seemed like, with all due respect to George Kleofbot did the entire time he was there, no matter what hand he was dealt by Larry Scott. Nebraska didn't uh, take long. They found their AD, Troy Dannon. Washington has now lost their AD. They've also lost their football coach. Uh, there's a lot. There was some blowback here from some that cover Washington that Dannon and his family never fully engaged in Seattle. He was there. He helped hire Jed Fish to react to DeBoer going to Alabama. Fired Nebraska, the basketball coach. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Nebraska replaces Trev Alberts who hired uh, and retired, they hired Troy Dannon, more of a Midwestern guy. I think he was at Tulane. So he's mm -hmm. got a pretty good resume. But if it's good for him, if it's good for Nebraska, that's fine. Washington, I'm sure, will pivot and make another decision. Uh, well, uh, they have to make another decision. Uh, Softy's immediate tweet was, go hire Pat Chun, which I would think that he's very gettable right now, given the fact that uh, I think so, the yeah. revenue Absolutely. has yeah. gone down for Washington State, and they're going to have to – honestly, like – not that him leaving would be doing them a favor, but financially, I'm sure it would. He's one of the highest paid guys in the athletic department. They're going to have to budget things differently going forward, uh, even with the the small the the war chest that lasts for two years that they have. But they, uh, but I would go hire Pat Chud right now because he's done a really good job at Washington State. Uh, they they win. Uh, look, they're in the NCAA. Double A tournament, they're they're good. They've done really well uh, in in spite of their disadvantages. And it's someone who's familiar with you. You just move them on over, and you can hit the ground running. Uh, I would not be surprised if that's the case because Pat Chun's been up for other jobs too, and yeah. stayed at Wazoo. Yeah, I have no idea what direction they'll go. I'm not uh, prepared with for the AD carousel as much as a coaching carousel, but uh, that seems to be a really swift and nice hire for Nebraska did not take them long at all to rebound from the Trev Alberts news and um, look at Washington's results uh, here lately they've had a pretty good little run so um, you're hoping that translates and that Matt Rule can uh, get some of that Kalen DeBoer magic to uh, to carry over football wise but yeah I think if you're Matt Rule or the other uh, coaches you're you're I think happy about this move. Um, so yeah, good for Nebraska and for Washington. I don't know how predictable this was, but they've certainly taken their lumps. I mean, what a great run. It's why, again, you enjoy it in the moment, right? Because Absolutely. you don't know when it's all going to just flip over on its head. And so here you are, you lose your, your great coach and some assistance and some of the players as a result of the NFL or, or just the, uh, the transfer portal. And then you get everything settled in a great hire in Jed Fish and Jed Fish won't even 
you know, uh, have a game under the Troy Dan and umbrella. So uh, just wild how that's turned out this offseason for the Huskies. They'll be fine, though. They're a great athletic program. But, uh, yeah, definitely a big job to fill, and there will be no short list of candidates, I'd imagine. If you're an AD and you leave, the coaches who you hired always have to. That's why Matt Rule, when the thought about Alberts, but he was at Tulane. He's the one that hired Willie Fritz. At Tulane, he was there for nearly a decade, 15 through 23. The SEC will remain at eight games, and I think that's pretty much what was expected. Nine in 2026. Uh, John Talty covers Alabama. They announced their eight conference games for each team in 2025. Start times, which is interesting. Start times changing uh, fans might appreciate what they do there. Am I crazy at this rate? Like in about two months, we're going to get the 2029 schedule for the SEC. It seems like, <laughs> it. like yeah, you'll, you'll mean, get the Big 12 schedule like next uh, March or something. Yeah, like that. it's just I feel like we're just getting so far ahead. But here, here's what to know about the SEC schedule for uh, 2025. Right, it's the 2024 schedule flipped. Yes. That's all it is. Yeah, it's, it's uh, whatever was home is yeah. away. There as far as the matchups ones, yeah, go exactly in conference, right. that's all it is. Is just take the twenty twenty four schedule, flip home and away conference opponents, and that's your schedule. Um, the dates will be different, but beyond that, if you were playing Georgia in Athens this year, you're getting Georgia at home next year. If you were playing Ole Miss on the road, you're, you're hosting Ole Miss next year. So that's the the simplest way to to break it down. And because of that. I looked at a lot of, I mean, mostly because of just history. I have more Big 12, uh, or I guess Texas or Oklahoma folks on my timeline than I do most of the others, and a, and a sprinkling of Texas A&M as well. And I know the initial thoughts on the schedule was that Oklahoma got one of the tougher draws and that Texas got a pretty uh, nice draw for year number one. And Yeah, it could have been more difficult. Definitely could have been more difficult. And so I think you, you look at that now – another year later and just flipping the schedule. And I think, man, what a great opportunity for Texas right out of the gates where I do think they got about as good of a draw in terms of hardcore opponents stacked up uh, as you could possibly get. And um, yeah, they're, they're going to be loving life with, with this schedule for the next two years, because even though there's some challenges, but it's just, it's not this, like it's made to sound like every week you're playing some juggernaut and that's not at all what it's really like. You're in the end playing, probably a certified really good three to four teams. And then it all depends on who's good that year. Like, is this the year where Ole Miss is really good or Arkansas just has a team that's better than expected? Or Missouri jumps up. Missouri or last, Florida yeah. going to remain neutral? That's like kind of what it depends on. Because you know if you got Alabama, they're going to be good. Uh, you know, how great they are, we'll see. But Georgia, they're going to be great. Texas, they're going to be really good. You know, so on and so forth. But then you get South Carolina – Mississippi, Mississippi State. You know, those are sprinkled in, so it's not as daunting as you really think in your head. It, it, when sometimes no. I feel like it comes across no. as though you're playing at Bama and then you're hosting Georgia and then you're going to LSU and then you're turning around and playing Texas. It's it's not quite that, but it is it is tough and it's fun to see these new layouts. Same teams Oklahoma is going to play this fall, but you still look at them. Auburn with Hugh Freeze year two this year. And then three next year, they have LSU. Well, they won't be down long. I say down for them. Yeah, they'll They're be back. Still really good. And then you have Ole Miss, who's red hot. Missouri, who right now is red hot. Yeah. And then, of course, the games with Alabama. <laughs> I mean, look. Tennessee. Oh, this thing called that. Texas, this uh, rival. So, yeah. and they I, won't, the one game you look at, you're like, South Carolina, and, and yet, Beamer, you know, you don't know how much he's going to go up and down with what they do with the Gamecocks. Well, I I think the thing I look at here is a home versus road, you know, in, in 2025 and how that flips. Look, Texas, their schedule on the road this year is, you know, at Michigan and at uh, – well, I guess Georgia would be well, at home. that's a non-conference game. Yeah, yeah uh, but, but like, is. as it far is. as road, like, that's their toughest spots is, is at Michigan uh, and, and probably at A&M. Uh, their the road games of, this year are Arkansas – a and M, Vanderbilt, as far as conference yeah. games in the neutral game in Dallas with Oklahoma. Yeah, so um, I mean, is that really that crazy? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's not, not like, at all. A and M's of of those four, you know, Oklahoma. That's something they do every year, sure. so that's not going to change. They know how that is. A and M will be probably is new for all these guys because that's been gone for over a decade. Is coming back, and the emotions around that game will be very huge from the fan base. I don't know how much that will catch with the actual players on the team because they. They didn't grow up with the rivalry like our generation right. did, but uh, I I think it'll be a weird one. But when you look at Texas in 2025, you know, at Florida, 
with probably a new coach if they don't get right, and which is probably and not fair to Billy. If it's not a Billy. new coach, maybe they're showing signs of well, coming be, out yeah, of yeah, hibernation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Especially given Florida's schedule that they've got the next two years. Uh, Arkansas with probably a new coach a- at home, you know, and Kentucky, Mississippi State, like Mississippi State's going to be a second year of Levy. So Look, you're it's going, not that yeah. – it's kind of like the way the SEC markets themselves to me is kind of like in and out Burger where, like, everything is so great, but the fries are garbage. So, like, yeah, the burgers are really good, but, like, yeah, it's not all perfect. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, not saying it's a, to knock the schedules either. It's just that I just think it's – you know, a situation where because they're just simply flipping, that Texas has a, a dream draw as far as your first couple of years, as far as it being digestible. I think Oklahoma's got a couple of years to begin with that are going to be really tough, that are going to be really tough. And at some point, Texas and will it'll have flip. what they it'll have. Flip. Exactly. But all we know is that the next couple of years, and and yeah, and just pointing out that it's not the, the necessarily the murderer's row week in and week out that it that it kind of is portrayed. And that's going to be the case. The bigger these conferences get, the less you're going to have that potential murderer's row. But, yeah, it's going to be fun to see these matchups. So UT at home in 25 will be Arkansas, A&M, Vanderbilt, and the neutral game with Oklahoma. Now let's get to Alabama. You brought them up. This is the Caden Proctor story. It came down yesterday's transfer portal on April the 15th and apparently going back to Alabama. Darren Heidner, who's uh, an NIL attorney, very much involved in a lot of the legal parts. This was his comment about Proctor. And uh, Kirk Ferentz, if you didn't hear it, he was obviously disappointed, said that he also, Proctor was able to get a big chunk of what Iowa had when it comes to NIL, which makes me wonder, this is what Heitner said, would love to see the contract Proctor signed with Iowa's NIL collective. If the collective didn't protect itself for this type of scenario, then shame on it. And I agree with him on that. Now, all right, we're we're gonna have to be careful with you and deep fakes. I can already tell, uh, based on the the Kirk Ferentz AI tweet that you thought was was. We're gonna have to be careful with you in, in this AI world. Oh no, I get forward. it, I get it. <laughs> um, but also, go ahead. No, oh, no, just because there was the deep fake of Ferentz out there talking as though he was commenting on this, and yeah. he, you no, said I, we're like, no, 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 that's not that's not real. No, so no, <laughs> I I looked at a quote yeah, on yeah. him responding. To yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, no, but it's it's a messy situation. Um, this is where. Well, I thought folks, AI was real. I thought that's a human. That isn't AI. Well, it's it's artificial like, intelligence. Like Alan Iverson. We had moved on, and now you're bringing us back to concern, to very major concerns. Um, uh, but no, uh, with the Caden Proctor situation, I mean, to me, this is a perfect example of people that are screaming about guardrails. This is what they're talking about. Yeah. It's not players shouldn't be able to make money. It's not that players shouldn't have freedom of movement. It's that you shouldn't be able to sign a contract and then never play for that school and cash a hundred thousand dollars and then leave. I mean, just that, that whole structure and situation. Now, is that only fixable by employee status and those types of things? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll default to the NIL folks and the legislatures and all that, that, that know how all that would work better. But this is what I think of when I think of guardrails is trying to prevent a situation like this from happening. No, yeah. I, I 100% agree with you. And it's going to be an ongoing concern and issue. Uh, we'll get to a comment from Malachi Moore, hell of a player for Alabama on DeBoer and maybe the players that uh, Proctor spent spring break with were able to discuss him as maybe the tide has turned after the initial shock and awe of Saban's retirement. We'll get to that, plus a couple of other notes in college football. Plus, Chris Vanini will be chicks, next. the chicks, man. Huh? It's all about the chicks, man. Chris Vanini from TheAthletic.com <laughs> who brought up the Tom Izzo quotes maybe being misconstrued, plus the college football playoff money and more and this is 365 Sports. Petty Clinic, LowT.com. Dr. Kent Petty can help you become the high-performance man you want to be, need to be, and used to be. As you get older, there are one out of every three or four men who have symptomatic issues of low T. What are those issues? Your sleep habits change. Your energy's not the same. Your focus is not the same. And your sex drive and your performance is not the same. You might have some or all of those symptoms. If you do, Dr. Kent Petty can help you get set up with get your blood work, check your T, uh, your, your uh, low T levels. And if your testosterone level is too low, he has a program, he has an option for you to increase your testosterone level by putting you in his program and helping you get rid or at least managing those specific uh, symptoms. How? Contact him. Dr. Petty and his staff are at Petty Clinic. LowT.com. 
Rev up your excitement. Celebrate the spirit of adventure during the Jeep Celebration Event. Join us at Alan Samuels in Waco as we roll out incredible deals on rugged and reliable Jeep vehicles you love. Seize the moment and drive home in the new Jeep of your dreams. With special financing options and exclusive offers, there has never been a better time to explore the world of Jeep. Hurry in. The savings won't last long. Visit alansamuelsdcj.com and see them firsthand only at Alan Samuels in Waco. Let your adventure begin. Come by. Let's be friends. Stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. See all the things they can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be part of the Waco community. We're a small family business here in Central Texas. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important. And unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. And that's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through this difficult time. So if you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. You can schedule online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or call 833-IDEAL-MRI. Johnson Realtors guide you seamlessly through the process of buying your dream home or selling your current one, commercial, farm and ranch, or residential. Camille Johnson Realtors can smoothly and successfully lead you through any transaction with a team of 28 experienced agents who are excited about serving you. Camille Johnson Realtors services the entire greater Waco area. If you're in the market to buy or sell, contact Camille Johnson Realtors, 104 Midway Center in Woodway, or find them online at www.camillejohnson.com. Camille Johnson Realtors, elegant, charming, Warm. Welcome home. Parenting is full of surprises. You never know what to expect. So after our son was born, I called my Texas Farm Bureau insurance agent to set up a life insurance policy in case something happened to me. Sawyer is now two. And we'll soon have a sister. There's no one else I would trust with protecting my family. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Baylor alumni are more than 160,000 strong. When we all join hands to support our university, we don't just move the needle, we move mountains. Working together, we create life-changing opportunities for students on the field, in the classroom, in the laboratory, and in life for generations to come. So get connected, get involved. Learn how at baylor.edu slash alumni. Let the journey to financial brilliance begin with Genco's limited time offers. Max your earnings with a Kasasa cash account and get paid monthly with a 4.25 APY. That's $425 annually. Then invest in a 13-month share certificate and earn 4.9 APY. That's $529. Earn cash and outshine the rest. At Genco, we offer you the sun and the moon. Kasasa based on average daily balance of $10,000. Certificate based on $10,000 investment. See GencoFCU.org for details. NCUA. This is 365 Sports. The 3 o'clock hour is sponsored by Waco Custom Marketplace. Meats, sweets, Texas treats, and a cut above the rest. 425 Lake Air Drive, Waco. Chris Fanini, TheAthletic.com, joins us. 365 Sports. Tim Brando later on today at around 5. And Chris joins us on a day that's, well, every day, Chris, when it comes to college athletics. Let's start with, I saw your tweet later on or earlier this afternoon on kind of looking deep into Tom Izzo's quotes because sometimes things can be misquoted or parts of a quote. Uh, In the end, what do you think Tom Izzo was actually trying to say? And by the way, thank you very much for your time. I think he was saying a lot of different things all at once. I went to Michigan State. I covered Tom Izzo for a number of years. Sometimes he just kind of says things that are not totally connected, and there were a couple of follow-up questions. But his line that got a lot of attention was him saying, um, I forgot exactly what it was, but basically, like, I know everybody likes upsets early on, but I'm not sure uh, what's best moving forward. But that came one line after he said he was uh, he'd love to expand the tournament for smaller schools to get in. He was also up. He's also upset. He's always hated conference tournaments, and he doesn't like that uh, number one seeds in certain conferences 
maybe don't win their conference tournament, miss out, and there's a bid thief and all that kind of stuff. I think that's kind of more of the stuff he was talking about. I don't think he was trying to say we should expand the tournament and let more Power 5 teams in or or uh, uh, we need to get rid of the small school AQs. He went to a Division II school in uh, northern Michigan. He's always been – Uh, about those schools. So I I think one line kind of blew up when in the greater context, it wasn't that big of a thing. Yeah. Chris, I think he, you know, the more, you know, especially after hearing you and I I went off on him earlier without knowing that um, a little bit, because the morning after Virginia scores 14 points and then with Greg Sankey kind of saying he wants to, well saying he wants to expand the tournament, but for the opposite reason, you know, Tom Izzo wants to expand it. So Indiana state gets in, uh, Greg Sankey wants to expand it so that Indiana State and more of those teams get left out. So it's it's two different sides of the of the same thing with them, and it, it probably is a very confusing time for everybody. Yeah, and I mean it is. We even joked at the beginning he was watching the selection show, hoping they'd expand it to a hundred because his team was on the bubble and they didn't know they were in until the very last bracket, so they were cutting it close. But you know, it's it's as though he's an older Italian guy and I'm Italian and this is kind of what you do. I mean, he complained about analytics. He's always been upset about analytics. He's always been upset about Twitter. Analytics are the reason Michigan state got in the tournament this year. Their resume is not great, but their net rating is really high. Their Ken Palm rating is really high. So I don't think, I don't know if Izzo thinks or knows that the analytics helped his team in that instance, but he is often, he can be, you know, old guy yelling at cloud sometimes uh, from now and then. I don't think anybody, I don't think anyone should take one line from him to be a greater deal. I think the things that Greg Sankey has said had a lot more thought and purpose behind them than maybe what a coach said at a press conference. Chris, uh, what did you make of the announcements that have been trickling out as far as the college football playoff, the expansion, the the money part of this, the distribution? I mean, uh, it's a lot to digest, and obviously there are still some loose ends to tie up, but we're, we're heading down the train tracks here, and, and how do you feel about it? I, I think what was the most notable to me, and it wasn't really new news, but the fact that ESPN is going to have the entire uh, bracket. I mean, technically ESPN can sub-license some games to other networks, but the fact that Fox didn't come in with some big offer to get in uh, was surprising because Fox had made some moves that seemed to show that it was open to covering more of college football than just the teams that it had games for the Big Ten Championship game two seasons ago, Nick, they let Nick Saban on at their halftime show to campaign for Alabama to get in the playoff on Fox, which has no connections to the SEC. So the fact that it's only ESPN, I think, puts a lot more power on ESPN because if, if you know Kevin Warren, when he was the Big Ten commissioner, some other people felt like you want to get multiple networks involved so they're competing with each other so you as an entity have more power. But if it's just you and ESPN – that gives ESPN a heck of a lot of power in that. And so it ended up being about $1.3 billion per year. It's quite a bit less than what people thought a couple of years ago. That's part of where the TV market is now. So it, in general, it's less money in one network, um, different than what we thought a couple of years ago. As it relates to the conference payouts, ultimately not surprising, even if I don't think it's good. The Big Ten, the SEC getting 29% each, ACC 17, Big 12 15, I think, and then group of five in, in Notre Dame. Um, ultimately, not surprising, 14 teams, who knows when. They may go through this whole next season before determining what to do. They don't need to rush it because ESPN's not paying them anymore if there's any more games. So they would basically just take two more games. Those would be campus games. You don't need to book a, you don't need to book a stadium far out. So they have time on this. But ultimately, the Big Ten and SEC are going to have a lot of control over if it expands. I don't think this is exactly the way I'm going to, what I mean, but they're already getting those two conferences. We understand they're bigger, better, faster, and stronger with very few exceptions. They're already getting massively more money from their conference TV deals. And now they're getting a lot more money for the college football playoff deals. It just separates them even more. When does that become a problem? And if they're as good as they are, or say they are, why do they want to keep separating from everybody else? Well, th- th- that's why I was kind of, I don't know, annoyed or frustrated or disappointed with the way it went out. You know, with the NCAA tournament, the more, the farther you go, the more money you get. 
Like it, it, it's pretty simple. Like, like the fact that they didn't put in a performance based, you know, way of doing it, I think it's a real detriment, but it just goes to show how much leverage the big Ten and the SEC have. They've made their own advisory group. They're very much floating the possibility of doing something else on their own because nobody knows what college sports is going to be in three years. But I think, it's also a reminder that we can stop pretending that any of the commissioners have the greater good of college football in mind. They're looking out for themselves because that's what they're paid to do. The, 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 the SEC, Greg Sankey is not paid to look out for the best interests of the big 12. And now we can stop pretending that any of these commissioners think that after a couple of years of playoff debate and trying to figure out what's best for college football, finally getting to the 12 team playoff and whatnot, only for them to all tear each other apart in realignment, change the revenue for 2026 and beyond and all favor themselves. And I think it's just really bad for college football that there isn't more of a united front on things and that uh, the richest only want to get even richer. Chris, I, I brought this up on our show yesterday in the, in the Clemson lawsuit uh, situation that Andy Staples wrote a, a great article on on3.com about it today. The ACC essentially, on paper, capitulated to the Big Ten and SEC. And when they did that, uh, they essentially uh, gave Clemson all the PR they needed to jump over whatever hoop or fence they had to to convince people that they needed to join Florida State on their way out the door. With this discrepancy, why would anyone stay with the ACC given the fact that their negotiating window doesn't come up until the next decade? Well, the reason you say is because legally you have to, at least at this point. You know, that, that's the thing. That's what the ACC is banking on is that their agreements are ironclad. I've talked to some lawyers about it, and they still think that the Clemson-Florida State case is pretty flimsy. That's not to say it won't work. That's not to say there won't be a settlement. But the ACC is not going to be incentivized to settle because – any way of Florida State and Clemson getting out could result in the unraveling of the conference. So nobody's quite sure how this is going to go. But if you're Florida State and Clemson, you compete for national championships in football. Like, that is your goal. Maybe Miami, but nobody else in the ACC expects to do that. And if you're Clemson and Florida State, you have to do whatever you can to get on the closer to the Big Ten SEC financial level. So – you're going to have to try to get out. It's the only way you can do that. And this is how you would start that process to see if there's any way you could get out at no charge or a lesser charge or something like that. So like n none of it is ultimately surprising. The big 10, the SEC make the most money because they have the most fans. They have the biggest brands and they get the best TV ratings. And with the consolidation of the TV market, it's natural that the money was going to consolidate around the conferences that have the most of it. Now, is it fair that Indiana is going to be making more money than Clemson uh, as it relates to television contracts and college football playoff payouts? No, but Indiana and Northwestern just lucked into being in the right conference at the right time 100 years ago, essentially. And so I get why Florida State and Clemson are doing this. I do not know if it's going to work. Um, and, and that's where we're at. Chris, you cover a lot of uh, coaching scoops and uh... – Man, I don't know. I was sitting there yesterday at Baylor football practice, and Dave Aranda is waxing poetically about Gary Patterson, and it all just is so strange still uh, to see Gary Patterson on staff at Baylor. But I was thinking of what a cool opportunity that is for defensive players in particular to learn from those two on a near daily basis. How I know Baylor's not a a program that many people are talking about right now, but how intrigued are you from just a, a coaching standpoint about the Dave Aranda Gary Patterson partnership? Yeah, you know, someone who remembers the Art Bryles, Gary Patterson rivalry of uh, not that long ago, it is kind of wild that since Gary Patterson got fired, we've seen him at Texas and now Baylor. Um, and this is kind of the way it goes. You know, loyalty only goes so far, uh, especially when there's a paycheck involved, especially when you got fired somewhere. Um, you know, it's interesting. You know, like there had to be a staff overhaul at Baylor after things turned so south so fast um and and so Dave Aranda did, did what he had to do it's it's so weird how up and down this program has been the last couple of years I mean to win the to to, to win the big 12 a couple of years ago sandwiched around two bad seasons I 
I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to make of the Dave Aranda tenure because it's just been a lot of wild swings for a guy who's very, you know, level-headed. He's not an emotional guy, obviously. So it just it hasn't matched the personality of the coach, and uh, this will be a big year, obviously. Well, Chris, just to, to let you know, they, Baylor just sent us a press release that they'll be honoring their 2013 and 14 Big 12 championship teams this year at the TCU game where Gary <laughs> Patterson is now on the Baylor staff and Carlton Buckles, Kendall Bryles, and Cos uh, Kazadi are on the TCU staff now. So you want to talk about weird, it's getting weird. <laughs> yeah, and I just saw no mention of Art Bryle yeah. in that as well. So <laughs> that is that is an interesting day to pick for sure. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that will be interesting, no, no doubt about it. What are your thoughts about what's happening with the ACC, with the latest deal, of course, coming with uh, what Clemson's doing, is how much more or longer will that be before that fractures, if at all? You know, it, it's hard to say uh, how long it'll go. It will be a process. You know, Florida State and the ACC have a hearing on Friday. It's just a, you know, one side is trying to dismiss the other's lawsuit. It's a normal procedural thing. I wouldn't expect it to actually happen. But these things are going to play out, and Clemson and Florida State kind of had to get moving on it because you don't know what the future is going to be. And, and like I mentioned before, if you feel like financially there is zero chance you can compete with the Big Ten and the SEC, while in the ACC, then you got to get out. And this is the way to try to start to do that. Is it going to work? I don't know. Like I said as well, ACC would is not. You're not going to want to settle. You know, like this isn't like oh, I will let you go type of deal because then you have to worry about North Carolina, Miami, and all these other schools potentially following it, which could blow up the whole conference in, in a Pac-12-like situation. So you don't know how long it's going to take. Everybody is very well aware of what happened to the Pac-12. Um, but again, just because you don't like the contract you signed, you know, 10 years ago, doesn't mean you can get out of it. I'm very curious to see how it's going to go. Chris Finney, theathletic.com. Chris, are you a brackets guy? Do you have one, five? How much do you dig into that? Because it's kind of the American way. Well, I, I, I need to do that tonight. I honestly haven't even looked at it yet. I was on vacation through Monday, and then I get back Tuesday, and the Clemson lawsuit happens. And so that's kind of taken up all my time. I need to get to that tonight still. Um, but uh, I, there's a lot of high seeds I don't trust. I don't trust Rick Barnes. At Tennessee, I don't trust Purdue, you know, so it's like a lot of these teams have historically not done well in their high seeds this year. It could be a very strange tournament. Chris, thank you very much for your time as always. Great for the connection to talk about Izzo off the top with your uh, history with Michigan State. Chris Benini, TheAthletic.com, with us on 365 Sports. Coming up, Ryan Hammer does analytics for college basketball. His thoughts about the tournament, his picks, he's, he, uh, he ran his tournament, and last year it spit out San Diego State Final Four. He was right. Does he have anything juicy like that for this year's tournament and more? Ryan Hammer, next on 365 Sports. I mentioned this yesterday. I'll mention it again, and I'll mention it for probably quite some time. I'm uh, going to go see a back specialist on Monday up in Dallas, and when I do, uh, I have to bring an image, an MRI of my lower back lumbar MRI. From I did one in 21 and did another one follow up in 2022. So I contacted Rob Maxey, one of the partners, owners of Ideal MRI, whose idea was it to have this business, state of the art MRI machine, and also $497 is how much you'll pay. That's it when the average is $1,100. I contacted him with a phone call on, I think it was Friday. He said, yeah, call the business, ask for another disc, go by and pick it up, and then also make sure the reading is a part of that because that's what the business in Dallas wanted. Sure enough, yesterday morning, went by Ideal MRI, picked up the disc, the image of the 2022 uh, uh, MRI, and also the reading included. It's just that simple. It's a big business, but it also is like really an... It, it's the, the access and the how you can get an appointment, it doesn't take forever. You don't have to wait for weeks and weeks and weeks. If your doctor wants an MRI, you bring it up or he might bring it up. They contact Ideal MRI. They set up an appointment. You will not wait long. You will not wait long when you get there. It's an easy walk in, and they will take care of you. Techs and specialists are great. 
The reading will get back to you quickly along with your doctor who can find it in the portal. Ideal MRI is located in the Central Texas Marketplace in the southern part of I-35 in Waco. With so many companies and policies out there, it gets so confusing shopping for insurance, and I never know if I'm getting the policy that's right for me. Luckily, I met the team at the Niche Group Insurance Agency. With the Niche Group, you can go to one company and get access to coverage options from many insurance carriers, and you get to speak to a real person about your specific coverage needs. With the Niche Group, I know I'm getting the right coverage at the right price. If you need insurance, talk to the experts at the Niche Group at 1-800-258-8302. Don Humidor, you're home with a 48-foot walk-in humidor with the elite cigar brands from around the world, including the number one cigar of the year aging room, Quattro Nicaragua. Plus, they have the great brands like Macanudo and Artur Fuente, Rocky Patel, Aston, and so much more. CBD, great for sore muscles, aches and pains, sleep, Vita Dreams and anxiety, mild depression, general health and wellness. Their staff, very knowledgeable on the subject. If anyone is curious about CBD, ask Carolyn Ashley, Don Humidor in the Townwood Shopping Center off Valley Mills in Waco. Baylor Scott & White Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, the team physicians for Baylor Athletics, diagnosing and treating all sports-related injuries, including concussions. These specialists also provide orthopedic services for athletes and non-athletes alike. Whether it's knee or shoulder pain, a wrist injury, orthopedic spine care, and even an arthritis and total joint clinic. Trust the doctors Baylor Athletics trust. Baylor Scott & White Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics wants to get you back in the game. Waco Custom Marketplace is your hometown grocery store with a full-service butcher shop and bakery. Hi, this is David Smoke. The butcher shop can take your customized orders for seafood, pork, and poultry and custom cut your favorite steaks from bacon wrap fillets, sirloin steaks, bone-in ribeyes, boneless ribeyes, and even prime rib. Cut specifically the way you want, the thickness that you want. They're all delicious. They have Norwegian salmon, mahi-mahi, catfish fillets, sliced ham or turkey, variety of cheese, and several options of sausage links, and even regular jalapeno or cheese snack sticks, fresh chicken breast or whole chickens, sliced bacon, pork chops, and ground beef, marinated beef or chicken fajitas, and always large briskets and tri-tip available, plus fresh vegetables. So the great product, customer service, and tradition continues at Waco Custom Marketplace, a full-service butcher shop and bakery, open Monday through Saturday. The Bauer Family, Waco Custom Marketplace, 425 Lake Air Drive in Waco, or WacoCustomMarketplace.com. This is 365 Sports. Text us at 254-339-1122. The text line is sponsored by Riverbend Liquor and Wine with the most extensive variety of craft beer in Waco. A hidden gem on Lakeshore Drive and 19th Street. Ryan Hammer, scouting, insights, analytics, basketball junkie, bracketology, uh, many things. It's what he does. He joins us now on 365 Sports with Paul Craig, and I'm David Smoke. Ryan, did you wake up in a uh, like in a fog after watching Virginia last night against Colorado State? Uh, that that was surely something. I think it's a nice way of saying it. <laughs> well, I was trying to be nice. I was. I was. That's not normally always my mo, but I was trying to be nice. So. Let me ask you this. Uh, we'll start with your bracket. You spit out bracket. You mentioned, I think, San Diego State was something that you had pegged last year. Is there anybody that might surprise a few people on how you have it going this year? Yeah, I mean, there's always surprises. And I like to be a little ambitious, obviously, with everything. And what's, what's Mark's managed brackets without having a little fun? But I think New Mexico is a pretty popular dark horse pick. I'm pretty high on New Mexico. I've been all year. Um, and they are going to be in Baylor's region, which is going to be in. Hopefully, we get them to play because they are going to be. That's going to be an unbelievably even match game. Um, I also like Dayton, who's in that region, who hasn't really gotten enough love. And I like a team like Drake out of the East region, who everyone's looking at Iowa State and UConn, but I'm looking at Tennessee Drake. Ryan, when you mentioned Drake, they they're going to have a little bit of the coaching, you know, uh, bubble hanging over their head with with their coach being up for a lot of jobs. What it about them makes you think that they can make a deep run? Yeah, well, the fact that they've won a good league that doesn't get enough love. The NBC, outside of just them in Indiana State, who everyone won in the tournament, of course, and they're a very good team. It's a good conference with Bradley and UNI and some other good teams. They won it last year. 
and they played Miami really, really tight in the round of 64. They just happened to play Miami, who was on an unbelievable heater in March, and obviously they went to the Final Four. Um, love their efficient offense. They brought in a good freshman in Kevin Overton. They brought in Atten Wright, a really good transfer, and Tucker DeVries is one of legit the best players in the entire tournament and doesn't get enough love. So, Ryan, what are your thoughts about Kansas now without Kevin McCullough? I think they're going to struggle. Um, I don't. I didn't like their matchup against Stanford and Buckyball uh, with, with McCullough because they don't have depth. They don't like to play at a high pace, and Stanford's going to go deep into the bench, and they're going to press you the whole entire game. Um, I think they're going to struggle even if they get out of that first game. I don't see them getting uh, out of the first weekend. Ryan, the uh, one of the uh, the hot teams going in after the SEC tournament would be Auburn. They're in UConn's portion of the bracket. It, to me, they're a team that could easily be in the Final Four and win a national title based on their on their defense and the fact that they score. They seem to be re- very well rounded. What do the numbers say about Auburn? The numbers will say they they can win the national title. I, I ran numbers a lot on based on historical metrics and stats. Who can win the title? Uh, there are six teams that you'd expect, and then there's Auburn, and it makes a lot of sense. Their efficiencies are really high. They haven't been amazing all year against the best, best teams, but they haven't had a crack at a team like UConn and stuff, really, other than really Baylor from that game in two falls um, outside of the SEC. But I agree. I think Auburn can 100% match up very well with UConn. What team that is a brand name, perhaps, but has not had a really good year, do you think might make a run this year? Um, interesting. I don't know if there are many because I don't like the Michigan State and Duke. I think Kentucky has a really good path, but I know that their defense is, is non-existent and they, they have been inconsistent and shown an inability to adapt to their opponents. So I think their path is really good for the Sweet 16 or Elite Eight. Um, but I, I just, I have so many doubts just in the back of my head about them. What about a team that has underperformed perhaps from what were the expectations making a run because they are they got a they got a lineup. They've got they got stars, they got playmakers, they got guys that are experienced. Anyone that, that pops out to you on that? Yeah, I, while I don't love the first round game because I think it's a fifty fifty game, I like Gonzaga if they can get past McNeese. And McNeese is a team that I have been speaking about for months. Uh, but I think Gonzaga's underrated because they're not this team that's been in the limelight all year, but they have tons of experience, guys that have been in the tournament. Ryan Nebhardt literally ran in the Elite Eight tournament team last year at Creighton, um, and they could face Creighton actually in the Elite Eight in that region, but I think Gonzaga's got that, got that chance. Who has uh, got to be like right off the top? You mentioned Kansas, not that you're saying they'll lose that game, but that could be dicey, and especially with McCuller, although they're almost used to not playing with him. Is there somebody that is ranked among the top one or two or three seeds that early on has – as one of those, you better be careful. You could get blindsided. Um, yeah, I'd say there's a couple teams. I think Marquette is a little interesting because they're not fully healthy. Tyler Kolek is going to be fine in play, but how healthy and how deep can they go? They have a tougher game with Western Kentucky who likes to really open it up and run, and then they could get Florida or a Colorado team that I really like, and then maybe Kentucky. Um, and I think, I hate to say I think Iowa State of the Big 12, who's been so good recently, but history will tell you that Teams that don't start the season ranked and on radar end up mm-hmm. being a top two seed. They usually average less than two wins per tournament, which would put you out uh, in the first weekend. So I like Iowa State a lot, but in a tough draw against South Dakota State and then maybe Drake, um, they might be back. Ryan, uh, which team do you think, outside of Virginia, obviously, but that <laughs> is in the field did not deserve it the most? Uh, the, the answer is Virginia, to be completely honest. When I did my last bracketology, uh, they were the only team that got in that I did not have in. So I hate to give you a bad answer, but it's Virginia. What is it about Nevada? And I'm not the fact they're good. They're really good. And there's always that kind of a team. There's like three or four of them that will get to the Sweet 16. And you have them knocking Arizona out and making a run. Yeah, I think the winner of Dayton, Nevada, whoever it's going to be, gets out. I think both those teams can really crunch the game down, but still play a really efficient offense and force Arizona into playing so many less possessions than they're used to. Um, and I think out of the teams, I look at Baylor, New Mexico, Dayton, Nevada. I like one of those four teams to come out of that little pod and get to the Elite Eight. What are your thoughts? Let's go down to Big 12, if you don't mind. You've mentioned Iowa State. We've discussed Kansas. Uh, obviously, what Houston did, they got they had the injury with Roberts at the end. 
really good throughout the year. I even had their play-by-play Jeremy Branham on earlier about have they run out of gas, and that's what can happen in a, a conference where you're just getting always just like a pounding, even if you win. What are your thoughts about Houston? And then we'll go down the list. Yeah, um, I love Houston. I think they can easily win the national title. I think this is the year of them not being in the AAC. They're playing, and you talk about the Big 12, the best league in the country by far. They play these teams like Kansas and Baylor and Iowa State night in, night out. They're much more prepared down the stretch of the season to be able to make a run to the national title. So I think they have that upside 100%. Baylor has announced that Langston Love is out at least early on and maybe for the rest of the tournament. If they have the rest of the tournament, they have Colgate. uh, And and then, of course, it, it never is easy. They've won the national title, been knocked out the next year by North Carolina early, and then, of course, last year struggled too. What are your thoughts about Scott Drew and the Bears? Listen, I, I've been a Baylor truther, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on with y'all. Uh, I've been a truther since they won the national title. I came down to Waco this year for the first time. I linked up with Ray J. Dennis and a couple of the guys. We did some behind-the-scenes stuff. I was at that Houston game that went to overtime, an unbelievable thriller. Um, I love this Baylor team. My issue with the team is that they've been turning the ball over way too much, really all year, but mostly in the last 10 games, and the defense has been very inconsistent. I'm sure you guys know these things. I think they have what it takes to easily make a Final Four run, um, but I, I, they have a really tough draw. I mentioned teams like New Mexico that match up really well against them in the round of 32. It could be dangerous. You mentioned Ray J. Dennis. He's one of those. He's been really good. But oh, yeah. he and none and others, they turned the ball over. You mentioned that. And it seemed like some of them were the opponents, you know, forcing them. But there's a lot of what looked right. like to me as unforced type errors, too. Yeah, there's small things that you notice that you, you kind of get upset at watching. And obviously, you guys as fans probably are really upset because, you know, like Ray J. Dennis, like you said, is one of the best and most secure playmakers and passers in the country. He's so underrated. He has great vision. I love his game. Um, and you just kind of get upset when little things happen that you know is a mistake that's way beyond his quality. Ryan Hammer, scouting insights, analytics, bracketology, defense appreciator, and more. Well, Baylor's defense is not appreciative. They're not very good on defense, ranked <laughs> like in the high 200s. Will that be their Achilles? Uh, even, even though you mentioned they are, they're capable of outscoring some people. Yeah, and they, they can definitely do that. Um, and the, you look at the team that won the national title, which is not really fair, but even the team – the year after with Jeremy Sohan and, uh, and Kendall Brown and everybody, like they had a lengthy athletic defense that was versatile uh, where they don't have a lot of big pieces like that. I love Eve Meese's game, but he's still got some to learn. And sometimes when they play the defense of four on the outside like they have and him on the, in the post on the inside, he's alone at times and he gets in foul trouble every now and then, even with uh, Josh and JCT to come in and help out and assist. Um, it's not easy. I don't think they have the defensive versatility and Swiss Army knife like a Jeremy Sohan and guys like that to be able to have that level of defense. I think it could be their Achilles heel because if they get into a really open game, I keep mentioning New Mexico because that's who they're probably going to play if, if they get out um, past Colgate, but that's a team that loves to play open games like that and offensive, so they don't want it to get too reckless. Ryan, uh, Jacoby Walter and Eve Misi will be uh, more than likely NBA draft picks or enter their names into yeah. the NBA draft. Do you think that's a wise decision for them, basketball-wise, or that they should stay another year? Yeah, I mean, Jacoby it was kind of on the lottery radar all year. He hasn't dropped past that. Eve has been a riser for sure. Um, I think, you know, it's up to them, obviously, what's going to be best for them. I was able to talk to Eve a little bit when I was down there and for a little while and connect. Uh, he's a great guy also, and they're great young dudes. Um, I think they're mentally and physically ready. So it's really just up to them to where they see their game and what their end goal is. So in a vacuum, I guess, yes, as long as they're getting what they deserve and what they earn and that's first round picks and the money that they want to get. Um, but it's up to them ultimately. You have uh, Charleston and Alabama. You have Charleston advancing. I was looking at, you have like five or six double digit seeds, which of course is what to me makes that first week and who can continue on so special. Alabama has this offense that can put up 100 points a game. Is that just a matchup where Charleston can match them with what they do too? Yeah, so my official bracket, um, that was a, it was like an AI generated with some stats and stuff, but my official bracket does have a lot of things. Charleston and Alabama is going to be as much of a shootout as you want. Both teams can put up 90 points with ease. Um, I think that benefits Alabama actually because they would love to, to try to get anyone to keep up with them. Their offense is unbelievable and they have no defense. So I think that's a game that they like, but I just don't know how they're going to be able to make a big tournament run without playing any lick of defense. All right, we've discussed Houston, Baylor, 
Iowa State, KU, um, I, uh, what, Texas Tech with Grant McCaslin. They've been gritty. That's the kind of coach he is. They've really done well. And uh, hammered Baylor to close out the regular season. Your thoughts about the Red Raiders? Yeah, they're interesting. Um, the NC State game is going to be weird the first game because it's hard to peg what kind of quality you're going to get out of NC State. Is it what we saw in the ACC tournament? Is it what we saw the majority of the season? But I think Texas Tech stands a better chance versus Kentucky for sure just to completely terrorize them and take them out of the offensive comfort that they have. So Grant McCaslin of our, is one of a, a few handful of coaches who can implement a system to beat a team like Kentucky. So BYU, a team that at times has been really good, and, and, and they've stayed that yeah. way, and they lost in the tournament, but a lot of everybody does but one team in Iowa State. Uh, they, they, they just seem to be a really good team that has maybe been under the radar a little bit. Your thoughts about the Cougars? Yeah, and it's funny we talk about these teams and how awesome is it for the Big 12 to get even better out of Houston and BYU and Cincy. It's, it's really been awesome. But they, I, I, I agree, I think they're a little bit underrated. They have a really good draw because Duquesne is an overseed in 11, and they match up very well against Illinois, who honestly has a tough matchup against Moorhead State, I think. Mm -hmm. So I like BYU's size and three-point shooting to have a really good shot against Illinois. All right, now let's go to TCU and then Texas. TCU, uh, a little erratic at times. They won that triple overtime yeah. game in Waco. The Frogs and Jamie Dixon. They are erratic is a good word. They like to play kind of crazy and reckless a little bit. Uh, Utah State is a good team. They're a little under also, like some of the Mountain West schools. But TCU can do it. TCU's got athleticism and size to battle with Purdue if they get there in the second round. Um, but Utah State is no is no uh, cakewalk. So Texas plays Colorado State, who at least warmed up with the win against Virginia. And then if they win, they have Tennessee. It appears Rick Barnes. They play St. Mary's or St. Peter's. Never want to like take anything for granted. How deep can they go? I think Texas has probably elite eight upside because we have seen. Tyrese Hunter and Max A. Smith be in other tournament teams and do really well with those who have experience that way. And even the rest of their front court, Dylan Mitchell was on the team last year that was really good. And Dylan Dessou and Caden Cedric was on Virginia, who's been in and out of the tournament for a couple of years. So I think they have a really good roster for who they're playing. Colorado State, they have the guard, the wing, the big to match up pretty well. And even with Tennessee, I think they have a legit chance in my bracket. A um, little spoiler, I guess I'll post it soon, but I, I have Texas winning somewhat because of Rick Barnes' lack of winning lately in March, but also I think Texas is good. Well, they they're, made the run last year to yeah. the Elite Eight, got and knocked they, out by Florida Atlantic. Yeah, they're just they're just so erratic, Ryan. I think that's why they're so hard to put a finger on is that they have this great, like, they can go to Lubbock and win a game by, by 20 points and then be at home and look like they forgot that, they, that basketball was happening in front of them. Yeah, it's, it's really tough. And I was at the game when they played Louisville. They barely beat Louisville early in the season, and I was kind of a uh, suspect. But like you said, in Big 12 play, they've shown that they can be okay. It's just what, what form of Texas are you going to get? And when you're filling out a bracket and when you're looking at it, it's tough to project, but that's, that gives them good upside but a really low floor. So, All right. Uh, you go to uh, tell everybody how to find you. I know on Twitter it's at RyanHammer09. Uh, tell everyone how to find your material. Yeah, I, listen, during March, if you just search my name, Ryan Hammer, on whatever social media you're on, you'll, you're going to find me. If you're not, uh, if you don't, I'm doing something wrong. So, <laughs> Is there a player in particular that you think America doesn't know enough about? And I'm sure there may be 15 of them, but America doesn't quite know that they might fall in love with in the next three weeks? Um, yeah, there's probably a long list of them. I think Tucker DeVries at Drake is one. Mm -hmm. People know it for sure. Uh, but I don't think the masses of people really know him enough. And Terrence Edwards at James Madison, some the college basketball avid fans will have heard of him a little bit in the Sun Belt. But if JMU can do anything, it's going to be behind Terrence Edwards. And he, he is someone to really, really like. So Ryan, thank you. Good luck with your uh, brackets online and also your knowledge. Appreciate your time. Ryan Hammer with us. Analytics, bracketology with the tournament, of course, starting last night. Technically, two more games tonight. And Wagner winning last night. They also advanced along with Colorado State, who opens now with Texas coming up in a couple of days. This is 365 Sports. Waco Custom Marketplace. I'm glad I went back on the website. I hadn't been there in a little bit because of uh, Brian and I. Brian Bauer, the owner, will sometimes send me text of what's going on. Guess what time it is? Guess what time of the year it is? Yes, they have a full service butcher shop and bakery. It is live crawfish time. 
Live crawfish, 30 pound bags for $4.99 a pound. You can call to order. The number is on their Facebook page. And also, you can go online to WacoCustomMarketplace.com. Also, orders must be placed. This is what their main deal is every year when live crawfish, these are sacks, 30 pound sacks of live crawfish. These are some dudes now. Order by Wednesday. By the time they close at six, you can pick up anytime after four o'clock on Friday. Order 30 pound bags, however many you want one, two, five, whatever. Maybe you're having a massive crawfish boil. Order crawfish bags, 30 pounders by six o'clock Wednesday. Pick them up anytime after four o'clock on Friday or even when they're open on Saturday. They also will have the potatoes, the sausage, what you want, they do. It's Waco Custom Marketplace, the Bauer family at 425 Lake Air Drive in Waco. Cars price right. Established in 2007 and independently owned, Alliance Bank Central Texas is committed to helping families and businesses meet their financial goals. From their tellers to their board of directors, they know the importance of superior service and competitive products. Customers have confidence knowing that their financial needs are in good hands. It's your bank, Alliance Bank Central Texas, with two Waco locations, 4721 Bosque Boulevard and 191 Archway Drive on Highway 84 and at AllianceBankTexas.com. Member FDIC an equal housing lender. Developed by Startup Waco, a nonprofit organization, GXG is a program designed to support the entrepreneurial development of Baylor University student athletes through NIL activations. The program helps student athletes maximize their platforms and offers a comprehensive support system for them to create and grow new businesses that not only benefit themselves, but also uplift the local economy. Fans who wish to support student athletes can donate to GXG via the GXG NIL fund baylorbears.com slash gxg contributions to support nil activations through gxg can be made at baylorbears.com slash gxg for more information follow at gxg underscore green x gold on social media and visit the official website www.gxg.startupwaco.com gxg empowering student athlete entrepreneurship and uplifting the local economy through NIL activations. Riverbend Liquor and Wine now has two locations to serve you. The original on Lakeshore Drive and North 19th Street and the brand new spot in downtown Waco at 600 Franklin Avenue. If you're looking for the best in craft beers or local Texas bourbons, then the original is the place to be. And for the latest trends and online phenomenons, head downtown to the Franklin location. Either way, you're going to get the same great variety, customer service, and speedy experience. Check out both locations on their Facebook and Instagram pages. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, Lakeshore Drive and North 19th Street, and now downtown on Franklin Avenue. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. The 4 o'clock hour is sponsored by Boozer's Jewelers, the wedding ring store, specializing in custom jewelry and repair, all in-house. Now, here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. I was mentioning Waco Custom Marketplace and those 30-pound sacks of live crawfish. And, Taylor, I might have to throw a crawfish rager this weekend when my parents uh, come to visit. Uh, They're amazing. I I love crawfish boil. I'm not a big crawfish guy, but I'll eat it if it's at a boil. But the potatoes, the mushrooms, the sausage, and the shrimp, I just, I just, I love it. I just Corn. The corn, no. How do I forget that? Because I love corn. Uh, I, I absolutely love corn on the cob. I, I am a big crawfish guy, and I know why you're not, because it's uh, 
You're not a very patient human being. No, the crawfish are like, you spend three minutes yeah. trying no, to get three like... Three minutes? Come on, you're just an amateur. You're just <laughs> well, an amateur. I, you my best buddy up. is Eric Horton. He's an Alabama guy, and he could devour like pounds and pounds and pounds of crawfish. It's almost I bet crazy. you, is it like watching him like one of those kids do a Rubik's Cube in 10 seconds? It's like a Southern guy watching him eat uh, boiled potato. Peanuts. Yeah, just like... like just you just, yeah. Sometimes, like, I, I remember I was at a... Like, I was in Washington, D.C. when I was 16. I was on a bus, and there was a kid who had a bag of Rubik's cubes and he did he had like 10 of them and he did them all in 10 minutes oh, and i God. thought like wow and then yeah. sometimes you like you go to louisiana you watch your alabama you watch somebody like tear apart a crawfish it's like that it's just so fast it is it is <laughs> like and i can do that with shrimp mm -hmm. i love shrimp but uh i i love a crawfish boil didn't get to go to really one i thought for thinking about i went to a couple of restaurants that had it but that's about it yeah. Garrett, you ever had a old crawfish oh, boil over God. there man i have crawfish boils all the time <laughs> the do you really is, yeah but the prices have been ridiculous this year, so I have not gotten none yet. Um, my dad was – my real dad was in Louisiana with a friend, and they were going to do a crawfish boil, and they had a, they called it audible because the shrimp was cheaper mm -hmm. down there. So, yeah, but I love crawfish, man. All right, well, we expect to maybe um – I think Brian Etheridge has one of those boilers, one of oh, those we can uh, do pots. It. We could do it. I can get all the other stuff, and so can Waco Custom Marketplace. I know that Bauer family would set us up with that. All right, so one of the stories that, uh, Paul, you mentioned with Chris Fanini, there has been this question about, will Baylor, 10 years later, is like what teams do a lot of times if they win a national championship or a conference championship. And 13 and 14 went by. We even asked Mac Rhodes about this last year. They are going to recognize the 2013 and 14 teams that won a Big 12 title at McLean Stadium against TCU. Now, we'll get to that in a second. Um, the 61-58 game was the 14 team. Gary Patterson is now an analyst on the Baylor staff. Kos Kazadi, Kendall Bryles, and also uh, Carlton, Buckles. Carlton Buckles are on the TCU staff. And I, I, I know one of the questions is, is everybody invited, including the coach that built those teams? I doubt it. I don't know. It's not really my business, but I'm sure that will be one of the immediate questions to that. That's up to Baylor to decide and maybe even for whatever they decide to do. But the fact is they had to wait to do this a year longer or five than they wanted to because they had to wait for the Baylor lawsuit to end. It did, and now they're going to honor those teams this coming season. Yeah, the, the final lawsuit that was hanging out there, and, and uh, I got a message from a former player. Uh, hey, just making sure that you saw this. And so clearly I think there's some excitement there amongst the players on those 13 and 14 teams. This would not be that big of a deal in the big picture if not for the fact that – the head coach is such a controversial figure from right. those teams. And so I would Art think, Bryles. yeah, Art yeah. Bryles. So I would think that, no, he's, he's not going to be involved. But I also really hope that while I understand those conversations are going to be had by people who feel a certain type of way one way or the other about it, please don't let this overshadow these guys who have waited for this honor for 10 years. I mean, this has been something that I feel like when last year came and went, there was a real concern about, like, are we being drowned out of history? Are we, like, not going to be recognized because there was this controversy that we had nothing to do with? And so the answer from Baylor's side was always, no, we're doing something, we're doing something. But until you see it, you're like, okay, are, are they just saying that or, or what? And so, no, they, they were uh, about their word, and, and here you go. You're going to get both teams honored at the same time, and a lot of players were on both of those teams. So I think that's awesome. I think it's deserved. I think you can't write about Baylor football with writing about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and there was a lot of good with the – a lot, a lot of those players and a lot of those games and a lot of that that time period. So uh, it deserves to be honored. Um, they deserve to be honored, and I'm looking forward to it now. In true Baylor fashion, they would schedule it for the TCU game <laughs> just to make it like that much more amped up than it, than it already would be just for people excited to see these guys. But, um, yeah, now there's like a little extra pressure there. And we know TC was played spoiler in like every form and fashion imaginable when it comes to playing Baylor. So yeah, why not like now you've got the let's go beat them on their day where they're honoring their Big 12 championship <laughs> teams in Waco. And you know what the odds would favor are going to favor them based on history but since they've won like 20 of the last 25 but, or but so, it's also yeah, no, yeah it's also fitting and it's going to be really strange. I'd be curious. I know Jack doesn't listen to us but Jack, how many picture requests have you gotten for Gary Patterson and Baylor Gear since yesterday? Have you gotten many? I just feel like people are interested to see him in green and gold, and the fact that he'll be on one sideline 
the opposite of where he was all those years ago, and the others that you mentioned will be in purple and black and white or whatever. It's just uh, it, it's weird how time goes by and things change, but uh, that'll certainly be a, 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 a typical rivalry between those two, which is always heated, but you add those elements and the switching of sides, and yeah, that adds a little bit to it as well. I, I can understand why the question's asked about Art Bryles. I sure. get that, but I do think that, and I understand the loyalty that so many people have for him, and he was the one that created all of that. And Craig, you're right. You can't tell the history of Baylor football without it mentioning as well uh, the scandal and all of it. It started up in 15, and eventually everything changed in 16. But I do hope that for the players that have been asking for this, that it does end up being about them too. I understand that's going to be almost impossible. I get it. But congratulations to those teams. We know a lot of the guys on those teams. And, man, they won it. They beat Texas in like what seemed like frigid, zero-degree temperatures to close out Floyd Casey. And then because of 61-58, amazing win against TCU in 14. Close out Mac Brown and Austin effectively yeah, no, yeah, as well. That's right. Brown's last I mean, yeah. game other than, I guess, a bowl game or – yeah, I think like two things need to be said here. The majority, almost all of the cases the, against the 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 wrongdoers have been adjudicated or out there, and, and I know that some are still kind of dragging on. But like the Baylor has has made an effort to move on from it the the right way, and I don't think schools always do that. Um, they've been very it's been very hard for them to sweep it under the rug. It's been very public, so. I think that they have handled this about as well as 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 they could, given a lot of circumstances. And I'm not here to like stand up for them. I'm just saying that you you see other people do worse things, and and they they put themselves in the situation. The players that are coming back are not the ones that are the that were the problem. These are the guys who fought and earned it, and things happen around them. And it's not fair to not honor them because of the bad apples. All right. You know, it's it's not. So I think that because you had some guys on that and that they're not going to be back, that's fine. That should those guys shouldn't come back. But there are a lot of guys who were the the heart and soul of building this the team up and winning those titles. So yeah, I think it, it it's long overdue. Well, if they're going to do 10th anniversary, they could only do it last year, but it's time for them to be honored, and the situation is right now where they can be. Well, they can be because the legal issues are all now taken care of. So there we are with that. Now, Well, that'll be a big game, big weekend around here uh, for for those guys. I mean, the fact that had somebody so eager to pass that along, like moments after it was was out yep. there, said a lot to me. So yeah, I'm happy for those guys, and yeah, that'll that'll. I mean, that TCU Baylor game is always a big game for both sides, but that'll add some extra uh, to it for sure. I remember last year on a couple of different occasions, uh, Jordan Niver, the former tight end, reached out to me and us asked us about it. I gave him exactly the answer that we got about the fact that there were – and it wasn't the answer that I got initially, but the background was there are things that have to finish out, which was the trials, and they did. And now, as you said, they uh, are true to their word about bringing those two teams and, back. And, and he, he's, he's thrilled about and it. And the one – just to not, not to get into details of it, but the one that was – had they honored the team last year while that was going on – the subject of that trial would have made it more difficult, and they needed that to be gone before it was over. So there we are with that. It comes up November 2nd against TCU. Baylor, TCU, they'll honor 13 and also 14. Now, we mentioned earlier about uh, Caden Proctor, the offensive lineman from Iowa, who was at Alabama, was an all-SEC, I think, freshman pick for the all-SEC. He decided that he's going to transfer to where his hometown, uh, State, Iowa. Hell of a pickup for Iowa. And then yesterday the story pops out that Caden Proctor is going to enter the transfer portal. And one of the stories was that he had spent his spring break with a bunch of former players at Alabama. Here is Malachi Moore, one of the stars of Alabama's football team, with Colt Kublik, who covers the SEC quite a bit. There are a lot of new changes. Coach Saban left a great legacy but Coach DeBoer coming here and being man enough to come up uh, here after Coach Saban and kind of take on the job head on, it's been really great. He's been bringing a lot of great new energy into the atmosphere and a lot of new ideas from just uh, scheme-wise. Coach Woe and what we will be doing, having more vision on the quarterback and things like that, it's been fun. So after a few weeks and finally the players get to know him a little bit, you'll see now where some of the players who obviously 
hated when Coach Saban made the decision. Now they're starting to kind of get to know what's happening with Coach DeBoer, and I'm sure that's been passed along to players, some of those who did leave if they want to come back. I mean, yeah, he's a really good coach. I mean, it's not like they just hired some tomato can off the – off the, the the shelf to fill the shoes of the greatest college football coach of all time. So yeah, I think uh, the more you learn, the the more insight you have, the the more experience around a guy that you have, then you're just naturally going to uh, gel better. And uh, I think uh, you know certainly there's probably situations where it's not a great hire and that doesn't work out, and that becomes pretty clear early on. But I think it's become pretty clear early on in Tuscaloosa that uh, Kalen DeBoer is doing some good things and developing some good relationships and planting some solid roots. And so. Um, not surprised that, uh, you know, necessarily there's uh, Caden Proctor returning to Alabama, but it's just the route taken, which is so sort of strange, uh, being a Iowa commit and then signing with Alabama and then entering the transfer portal and then out back at Alabama. It's just a, it's a, a interesting route to take, uh, but apparently he made some money along the way. <laughs> he's, we know that, mm-hmm. and he's, he's played some football, too, and we'll get to play more for the Crimson Tide, and that's a huge land for Kalen DeBoer. I mean, one of his biggest recruiting wins thus far, no doubt about it, and, um, yeah, it's just something to where this will now be used as an example when talking about the need for guardrails, but that's okay. I mean, that's, that's fine. If it gets us to a better place in terms of the rules at play, uh, for everybody involved, players as well, then that's a good thing in the long run. So maybe this creates a, a better change, but uh, you know, good for Caden Proctor, good for Kalen DeBoer, good for Alabama, terrible for Iowa, and I uh, hate it for them. But yeah, that's a that's definitely a tough pill to swallow. So it, it, it's it's like good for him, and of course they got the staff together, including a couple of members that were a part of the Baylor staff. I, I do think that uh, this is a situation, though, especially in talking about the the guardrails of you're not going to lose any Alabama fans because of this. You're not going to lose any Iowa fans either, but I do think there was at least some sentiment that I came across. And granted, it's Twitter. It's it's a drop in the bucket mostly, but I do think when fans are just not looking at it us at, like us like every day, and I don't mean casuals in the sense of like they loosely follow along. I mean like people who love college football but don't necessarily pay attention to the nitty-gritty details every day because they've got jobs or they got other things that they, they want. When they come across a story like this, I do think it rubs you the wrong way. Like, what's going on? This dude was at Iowa, and then he's – No, it does. I mean, and, it's, and, and I think that makes people who aren't, you know, so super focused on it to just go like, what the hell's going on in college football right yeah. now? And I, and I don't think that's a good thing in the long run. So I no. do think that's something that you've got to be mindful of. It, it also, like, the system as it stands right now um, allows people of an age where decision-making is not necessarily the strong suit for the majority of them, like, to get, you know, to get rattled a little bit and to, to, to do something like this. I'm not – like, Caden Proctor needs to be where he's going to be the most happy. That's where he needs to be. Right. And so I'm not criticizing his decision, but like I said, like if there's some sort of system in place, whatever that is, that doesn't allow this because – Like I would assign him to a deal, him make yeah. money, and him never play for yeah, Iowa. Exactly. Like so that, yeah. if, if – um, and, and it's not because Iowa let him go. He chose to leave. You right, know, it wasn't, yeah. it's not like in the pros where I sign with the Baltimore Orioles, they give me a contract that's guaranteed, and then I don't make the team out of spring training. Well, all right, well, I still get that money, but you're the ones who decided to let me go, not the other way around. It's not that. He decided to let go. I can't just decide after three months of being in Baltimore that, Oh, I don't, I'm all, I'm over crab cakes and I want to go play for the Phillies. Now I can't just do that. You know? So the more it gets like professional sports and when you're paying kids, it is become a professional sport. Then you have to make it to where there's contractual limitations at least so that these things don't happen to protect everybody involved. Now, having said that, that's going to require some type of guardrails that aren't just simply like NCAA rules, but like, actual like real deal rules in place that would probably lead you down the path of employment guys so again we reach a point where what's the solution to this question or this issue it's the answer that they don't really want to go and wrap their arms around because of the financial responsibilities and all that would be dedicated to having players as employees but that's the solution that's the signing of a contract that's ensuring that you don't bounce in and out of the transfer portal but they're not ready to go all in on that yet. So I'm 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 glad for Caden Proctor from the standpoint of if you were gonna go and be miserable in Iowa City, then uh that's you know, 
something that you're able to avoid. It's like one of the players, I think, said the Alabama Pro Day was talking about this, like grass isn't always greener on the other side. So I guess from just a a human standpoint, like good for Caden Proctor to see a little dose of what he thought might be a better option and realize like, uh-oh, you know what? This is actually better where I was and that, that fits me better. To have that freedom of movement that a lot of players didn't have for so many years is a good thing, but it totally screws Iowa <laughs> in so, so many ways. So there, there's got to be a better way overall, but I don't think the answer to that question, like I said, is, is one that many of the folks involved want to go embrace all the way right now. All right. Uh, also this note, Oklahoma football, DeMarco Murray, a hell of a running back. Played in the NFL, Cowboys, what, Eagles? Uh, he's on their staff. He's been offered, according to Pete Nakos, a three-year contract to remain with Oklahoma. Has also been tied to the opportunity at o- Ohio State. DeMarco Murray always enjoyed talking to him whenever we had the opportunity. Hell of a running back. And there we are with that and OU. Now, Baylor football started their spring drills yesterday. Just a quick note about a position that is being decimated with injuries Uh, including Trey Emery, who has been battling back injuries throughout his uh, career since he got there from uh, Mount Pleasant High School. Uh, Jarrell Boykins out as well. This is a position that last year didn't perform well. They had injuries last year. This has really been one that they've struggled with. Dave Arando, after the practice, Craig was there, I was there, Jack was there, talking about, yeah. And you would think, Craig, that they're going to have to find a way to get into the portal and find a couple of extra bodies. You never have enough big dudes in the middle of your defensive line. Yeah, the problem is, is that's the same thing for every school in America. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, you need suddenly some big bodies. And I think it was telling that Dave Arenda didn't even say, like, impactful players, but, like, just simply big bodies to basically eat downs and, and eat up space. And uh, the the more skilled, the better, but the more skilled, the pricier, uh, the more skilled, the the harder to find because, again, everybody from Ohio State to Baylor to whoever else is, is looking for the same thing, uh, especially at nose tackle. So, yeah, that's a, a not a debilitating, but it's a blow that hurts when you have two guys who you were hoping to get much more out of than you, you ever got out of them because their careers were just sort of very abrupt in, in – um, in the case of their time at Baylor. So not what you wanted to hear. There was rumblings about it, but to get the confirmation on both guys being medically retired, hate it for them. Obviously their careers end way too soon. Um, and I'm sure some dreams busted in the process. That's part of the deal. It's part of life, but uh, just unfortunate all the way around for them as players and having a deal with as mentioned back for Trey Emery. I think it's knees for Jarrell Boykin uh, Boykins. Um, so you hate that, but yeah, you really hate that from the standpoint of you're kicking off spring ball. And you've now suddenly just got this, massive void right in the middle of your your defense but hey if Gary Patterson and Dave Aranda can't figure it out with six months to to figure it out then oh well I mean what else are you gonna do if they can't figure it out then no one can so uh, you've got about as good of a defensively minded duo as you could possibly have on staff right now Um, that's not going to make the transfer portal more robust with talent but that leads you to believe that they'll figure something out that'll be suitable as suitable can be without the the proper type of bodies there. So yeah, it sucks, but we'll see how they move or maneuver around it this spring and then whatever they're able to find in the portal. But again, it's going to be a very packed shopping uh, market with people looking for defensive linemen. That's why Texas's defense last year with Murphy, with Sweat and others was so really damn good because they didn't just have bodies. They had really good players and they'll just retool that but it's hard to find them because, like Craig, you said, everybody looking for the big, quick, or run stopper, uh, a fire plug type defensive tackles, and some of them nose tackles that could also make plays in the backfield. When we come back, I, what- I have something from Jeff Goodman. Okay. Um, he's just posted breaking news Baylor Scott Drew will remain. At Baylor, sources told the field of 68. Drew obviously had been a top target of Louisville and other schools. So, uh, Trilly Donovan, who is a, a basketball account, we don't, I don't know who he is. He's got a great name. He's a great b- basketball account follow. He'd kind of alluded to this already uh, a couple days ago, saying that, that Drew had told Louisville no. Uh, Jeff Goodman reporting this. Um, he has a very good relationship with Scott Drew and the staff there. So, I would say uh, take that to the bank. Yeah, I don't think any of us were ever really all that concerned about yeah. this. Uh, I think we all made our peace, and the only crack I left open was just simply somebody wanting to change, so just for the sake of change. Like, you get tired of being somewhere. It's just natural. You want to go like, hey, I 
want to go live somewhere different. I mean, beyond that, though, there was no real reason for him to be changing jobs. I mean, none whatsoever. History at Louisville aside, respect all that. Great history there. Um, you know what? Probably going to be in the Big 12 soon, the way things are going, right? <laughs> Probably going to be playing Baylor in Big 12 basketball sooner rather than later based on the trajectory of things right now. But, yeah, that's – I don't – are any of us even – do we even blink Here's at that the thing. news? I want to say this, if you guys don't mind. Go ahead. When all the uh, speculation started, I talked to a couple of donors at Baylor that I would think would know Scott about as well as anybody else. And I even asked him. I said, so, you know, again, I have – we have to do our due diligence. All of us have to. You never like want to get caught with your pants down. And one of them said there is absolutely nothing to it, but your agent is getting you whatever you can, yep. which is we've discussed this many times before. And one of the deals that perhaps Scott would want more of at Baylor would be the fact that the NIL money, which is healthy, uh, perhaps there's even a way to make it even better where Scott doesn't have to sometimes go make up uh, uh, not make up, but have to go and uh, create events to help with the NIL. When I talked to somebody in the administration at Baylor, uh, they said there, there's just this is not that's not going to happen. I'm not not the NIL that they don't see any way at all. Not being blindsided that Scott Drew was moving on elsewhere. Again, the agent has his job. Scott has his job. He's also coaching his team. So then uh, we had Scott on last week. And he basically said the same thing that he's probably said to everybody else, that he's a big one to play here, one of the middle championships here, President Livingstone, Mac Rhodes, whatever. To me, one of the few things that would have ever made him thought about, or think about leaving would have been his relationship with Mac Rhodes is great, like great. And I know that there's been things that Mac has dealt with in recent months and whatever, that if Mac was to leave, that might open up the door. Remember that spine, President AD, board, President AD, and coach. Um, well, if, if Matt Rule can leave after Trevor Albert, since Scott Drew's got the resume to do whatever yeah. he damn well wants to, all due so respect to Matt Rule. The yeah. one other donor told me about the NIL thing, that they'd like to see maybe that beefed up a little bit, an endowment or whatever. I never once thought that really, although it's out there, was it something that if we talked about it, it was bringing oxygen to fire. And so Jeff Goodman's reporting it. That's great. Scott mentioned it on our show that he's going to be winning multiple national titles at Baylor. I understand coaches have said that before and walked out the door the next day. So I get that that wasn't a, I'm never leaving Baylor. So this is good to put it to rest, move on, and uh, nobody is more happy, I'm sure, than Scott Drew and, and also Baylor. And also, let me put it just very frankly, as good of a job as Mac Rhodes has done at Baylor, if – he let a second national championship basketball coach get out the door oh, while the football no. team is struggling. Yeah. Then, then like all that stuff gets forgotten by the the, the power brokers really, really fast. No, well, you can't. That ought to be followed by uh, you basically announcing that you are going to basically be like a Division three school moving forward, and that you have no <laughs> intentions of competing at the high. I mean, that's what it would have to follow for that to be excusable in any way, shape, yeah. or form. And because that's not of happening. different yeah. circumstances, if he left compared to when oh, a three-time yeah. national championship coach left, who was amazing and is a Hall of Famer herself and Kim Mulkey. Yeah, so that 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 was uh, something that was out there, and that's good to put to bed, especially just ahead of the tournament. You don't want to have that sort of lingering over your head. Uh, but there is another little piece in the uh, ACC, FSU um, saga that's ongoing. Not a big deal, um, but just reports out there now from Chris Vanini, who we, we talked to uh, earlier in the show, uh, that the ACC has now filed their own legal challenge against Clemson in North Carolina court. Um, and it argues that Clemson cannot get out of the ACC grant of rights or the league exit fee. It's the same thing that they're doing with Florida State. And uh, it also quotes Clemson's president uh, in the start of their argument and gets into um, you know, the venues and all of that. But just saying, just passing along that another back and forth salvo between the ACC and the schools looking to test the grant of rights as uh, the ACC's got cases against it, and now they've got cases against uh, both Florida State and now Clemson as well. So, we wouldn't be able go. to do a show without a lawsuit story. No, nope. can't. Uh, can't whether it. it's realignment or whatever else. When we come back, former Baylor star guard Tweedy Carter, now a part of the Scott Drew staff, his thoughts about as they start the tournament Friday against Colgate. Tim Brando will join us a little bit after 5, and this is 365 Sports. Richard Carr, Buick GMC Cadillac, 
They are the people you've been able to count on uh, in looking to buy vehicles, uh, trade in your vehicle, uh, get anything done with your car now for over 20 years. And here, the month of March, there's a lot of madness uh, when it comes to hoops, obviously, but there's a lot of great deals and good type of madness going on right now over at Richard Carr as they are celebrating their 25th anniversary in big style and with big savings uh, here in Waco. To celebrate, uh, they have... Various offers. For example, you can save thousands on a GMC Sierra SLT crew cab. Qualified buyers can get 1.9% financing for 72 months. If you're military, first responder, you can also save an additional $500 as well on the new GMC Sierra SLT crew cabs. Thousands in savings, mad savings as they're calling it here in the month of March. And also, if you purchase a vehicle, a car or truck during this March, uh, this mad March anniversary event, uh, enjoy some hoops in uh, even greater style by getting yourself a 65-inch 4K TV with a car or truck purchase during this anniversary sales event. That's right, a 65-inch 4K TV on top of the sales uh, savings that you already get on the vehicle you're purchasing. And uh, during this event, they have big savings on over 90 highly inspected used cars and trucks, so the pre-owns involved in this as well. If you're not looking to go jump into that new GMC Sierra SLT crew cab, there are other options, and 100% credit approval is always the goal, as they say yes when others say no. So, a lot going on right now, but take advantage and go see celebrate with the good folks over at Richard Carr, uh, who have been in business now for 25 years in Central Texas, and during that time has built a reputation as the people you can count on for your automotive needs. Log on to richardcarr.com today. Call now or go see them now off Highway 6, the Imperial Exit. It was broad daylight. I stepped into a gas station for five minutes to grab a snack, and just like that, my car was broken into. They made out like a bandit. My laptop, my phone, everything. I called my agent to see what could be done, and he restored my faith in humanity. My claim was processed so quickly, and I was able to recover my losses. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Thank you for calling your local Marco's Pizza. We're turning up the heat with our new Reaper Cheesy Bread. Fresh, house-made dough is topped with a spicy cheese blend infused with jalapeno, habanero, and Carolina Reaper peppers. At only $5.99, this limited-time product is a hot deal. Add it to your order while you can. A Marco's team member will be with you shortly. Marco's Pizza. Pizza lovers get it. And that offer on the Reaper Cheesy Bread is available right now at any of the five Marco's Pizza locations in Waco, including Bell Mead, Chida Spring, Robin, Woodway and Hewitt. Order online at Marcos.com. Call for a pickup or delivery. Marcos Pizza is turning up the heat with their all new Reaper cheesy bread with fresh hot house made dough topped with a spicy cheese blend infused with jalapeno, habanero, and Carolina Reaper peppers. And only $5.99 and for a limited time only. Marcos Pizza, the fastest growing pizza brand in America. Five locations in Waco and the new Reaper cheesy bread. Marcos Pizza. Pizza lovers get it. Established in 2007 and independently owned, Alliance Bank Central Texas is committed to helping families and businesses meet their financial goals. From their tellers to their board of directors, they know the importance of superior service and competitive products. Customers have confidence knowing that their financial needs are in good hands. It's your bank, Alliance Bank Central Texas, with two Waco locations, 4721 Bosque Boulevard and 191 Archway Drive on Highway 84 and at AllianceBankTexas.com. Com, member FDIC and Equal Housing Lender. Stepping into a new pair of boots is great, but stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can also add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. There are more than 150 occupational specialties to help them find the best fit for their future. See all the things your son or daughter can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. Three sixty five sports is turbocharged by Unite Private Networks. Find out more at UnitePrivateNetworks.com. This interview with Tweedy Carter, former Baylor star assistant coach, is brought to you on the Richard Carr 
Baylor Bear Hotline. So, Tweedy Carter, it is March Madness tournament. Starts, of course, this week. Baylor Friday against uh, Colgate. Does everything increase like you hear in pros, like the regular season to the postseason? Does it go up this week? Um, I, I think so. Um, you know, especially when you're going into March Madness, March Madness because everybody knows you lose one, you go home. So, the intensity, the pre- preparation, and you can't underestimate anybody. So, they, you know, Colgate is a really tough team. You know, they're in a tournament, so you got to respect them and come ready to play. So sure. you're you're coaching now and have been. It's not like you haven't been, but how much of a challenge was it initially for a guy that made things look easy, even though there was a tremendous amount of hard work involved? <laughs> but you helps help. You know, you kind of help kickstart what is the standard at Baylor. Uh, it, was it an, was it difficult for you who uh, you were so good at what you did to try to communicate that to players? Um, I think that the same approach as I took as a young player coming into Baylor, um, just seeking knowledge, I think, uh, you know, helped me as a player. And I think, you know, going about it the same way as a coach with all the experience we have on staff, you know, why not come in and seek knowledge right away? to make your job a lot easier, you know, um, always a tough adjustment doing something you haven't done, but I felt like, you know, as a player leading and, and, um, you know, training when I was, when, when I was coming back in the summers and stuff like that, dealing with young kids and coming into this and being around Baylor in general made this, uh, coaching thing is a lot, a lot easier for me because I've been around, I know the guys. And like I said, the staff, do a tremendous job helping me understand a lot of things that I may have questions for, about, and they make it a lot easier for me. So I'm really blessed in that area. How do you react when you see an unforced error by a guard? Uh, not, no, I don't react much because I know they're not doing it intentionally. Um, you know, you just try to help them, um, hope that they can make better decisions, you know, moving forward. But it's, it's not a big reaction. It's, it's more so letting them know that they're, you know, making simple mistakes you can't allow, especially at this time of March, of March Madness. Do you feel like that because of what I call the battering ram of the Big 12, and other conferences have top to bottom pretty good too, we know that, but there are no off nights. There, are Even West Virginia, Oklahoma State could take people down to the wire, and you experienced that uh, in a way with yeah. both. It, it, do you feel like it's kind of refreshing to get away from playing somebody at least early on against in the Big 12 and play somebody else in a new face? Uh, the Big 12 is always tough, and you got to appreciate it because, you know, when you're in the Big 12, you're really playing March Madness games throughout your, throughout uh, the Big 12 season, regular season, and conference tournament. So it kind of helps you get prepared. But most definitely, um, you know, but, but that's what I'm saying. You know, you, we, we, got, we have to look at Colgate the same way. Um, we have to come in with that, with that mind frame. We're playing another tough team. We, we're going to be in a dogfight. Let's just come ready to play. And God willing, be God willing so, on that. Yeah, no, it, you're right, because that's why March Madness, in the end, it's a national champion. Everyone remembers whoever wins it last year, UConn, 21 Baylor. After that was KU. But March Madness is known for the teams that stun the world, even though if they're pretty good, even though if they're a high seed, whatever conference they come from. Is that is that what motivates everybody, no matter the school this week? Yes, I agree. Um, I think, you know, you're going to have some upsets. And you just try not to let it be you on those situations. But, you know, you got to come ready to play, man, and, and do your homework and study film. And, you know, the staff going to do whatever we need to do to make sure that they're prepared. And they got to continue to do their job. And I think they've been doing a heck of a job of uh, making sure that they're prepared. And, you know, now we, we're getting ready to go to war uh, for March Madness, and we're all looking forward to it. You know, you think about it as, as a point guard, or just it doesn't matter what sport, what position, what level, focus on every single pitch or possession or whatever, uh, snap. Is that is that possible to be that focused on every single part of the game? I mean, if you look at the Big 12 for us, that's what we're used to, one possession games. So if, if, if throughout the whole season you're having one possession games throughout the Big 12, you know, you got to take it serious. And, and that's just, it's that much of a detail to pay attention to every possession. And, you know, mistakes will happen. You know, you always want to limit them. You know, people is going to they're, they're going to score. You always want to limit easy opportunities. And I think if we, we can do all those things, um, you know, it'll help it'll play in our favor for sure. Tweedy Carter, former Baylor great, and, and I say former Baylor great, and then also a part of the Scott Drew staff. And you've mentioned the staff. Some of them have been yes, around sir. a long, long time. 
How have they, and it's not, this is not your first year, but how have they uh, welcomed you and helped you or allow you to pick their brain and given you suggestions yeah. and then again allowed you to be you? Yes, and uh, I mean, a lot of them have their own way of going about things, and that's what's, that's what the beauty is about learning from these guys is that you can learn different things from each 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 coach. And, you know, just going to them and talking to them, making it easy to go talk to them, I think is the, the biggest thing because, you know, sometimes when you want to have certain conversations can be uncomfortable, but, you know, this staff don't make it uncomfortable for me. Whether it's a simple question or a question they have to think about, they always have an answer for me and they always want to help, you know, each and every one of us get better. And I think that's the that's the beauty in this staff is that everybody is on one accord and, you know, trying to do whatever they can to help the players and help the staff be successful How and much, help this program be successful. How much have you seen a change, not in his personality, but his confidence, who he was always, you know, he said from the beginning Baylor was going to compete for a national championship, and we know they have mm-hmm. and did it. How much have you seen Coach Drew change when you were a player to where you are now? Um, you know, that look in Coach Drew's eyes when I seen him on that on that podium, you know, meant the world to me because I knew he was serious. And, you know, like you just said, he accomplished that. And, you know, I think his hard work consistently um, now is, is unbelievable. Um, but as a coach, you know, the, the change, you know, I, I always tell him, I said, you was harder on us back then, but I always mess with him, but he's he he's the same way to me. Um, he get on guys when he need to, um, you know, talk to guys when he have to. You know, that's that's always a great thing to, to to have a coach that's willing to always communicate with with the players. And I think these guys respect that a lot because not all coaches have that 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 communication with every player on the team. And so, you know, coach bringing that energy, I think, help uh, settle everybody down, including the staff. Is it, um, I want to say underrated, is there, uh, sometimes people don't realize if Coach Drew needs to get a point across, he's absolutely not afraid to do it, and he can get pumped, excited, focused, uh, <laughs> you know, angry without losing his cool. Have, is is yeah. is that something that people maybe don't quite know about him? Uh, I, I, would, uh, I would say, yes, they don't. A lot of people don't know. Coach Drew is very, very tough and very, very a t- – he's a tough competitor at that. Uh, he wants to win in everything. Everything that he does, he, he, he really uh, takes that approach. And, you know, to feed that knowledge on to the staff and the players, I think is a great thing because, you know, playing for him as a player, I was very, very confident because of him. He believed in me. And I think I, I see the same thing with the guys now and with the staff. So he believes in you. He wants you. He's going to always push you to be the best you could be. And I think that's what you got to appreciate about appreciate about Coach Drew the most is that he's always the same, but he's very, very competitive, and he's tougher than than everybody gives him. I tell you that. So before the end of the year, when you had Kansas at home, Texas at home on a Monday, and then you turned around and went to Lubbock, that didn't go well. But those last three games, John Jacobs told me that Coach Drew did a very passionate, um, inspiring uh, speech to the team about. March Madness, the grind of March Madness. What did he say, and had you seen him do that to you back in the day? Uh, yes, he always have a speech for March Madness. Um, you know, and, and the biggest message is don't take anybody for granted. You know, come out and let's play our Baylor basketball and know that we've been prepared for this throughout our Big 12 season, um, you know, and things like that. And he always try to find a way to keep us motivated and you know, I, I think that's that's smart, um, you know, because none of it, he's, he's not making up any of it. You know, everything that he talks about happened. You know, we make it to the uh, March Madness my, in 2008, and we get beat first round to Purdue. You know, those things happen if you don't come ready to play. If you are happy to be somewhere, you don't, you don't focus well enough, you can get sent home quick. And I think that's the biggest message that he's trying to pass on is that, we have to be focused, um, you know, from now on until we play uh, Colgate, you know, because it's going to be a tough game. It's going to be a game where you don't want to look back and say, I wish I would have did this and I wish I would have did that. You know, um, like I said, getting prepared uh, for Colgate has, has been everything um, for us this week. Focus on us a little bit and then start getting prepared for Colgate. Everybody else you play, the coaching staff, they're all good. Everybody's good. Hall of Famers that are part of the Big 12 and elsewhere. But with the staff that you have and you're a part of that, 
and the experience, how often do you guys see something that you didn't expect? Um, you know, I think I think you find out something different about the game every time you play. Um, every time you practice, we practice a lot more than we play. So we see uh, we see a lot of things that we can get better at through practices and we try to emphasize it through the games. And then after the game, you find out different things that you can possibly get better at, um, you know. And that's the, that's the approach I think everybody takes is always trying to figure out how to get better, even if it's something small, the details of it. And, uh, you know, Coach A.B. always say, same old boring habits. And I think if you can have those things, those same old boring habits, I think it allow you to prepare a totally different way for any team that you're going to face. How hard is it or difficult has it been with Langston Love in and out? He comes back, he gets hurt, he comes back, he can't finish, he can't play the next game, he couldn't play in Kansas City. And I know that what he brings to the table is a a physicality and also experience, and he's good. He can score and defend. How hard or difficult has it been, the challenge of him not being able to be consistently in the lineup? Uh, It's always hard uh, for for a player like Langston Love to be missed. Um, Like, you know, that's that's a really, really good player, like you just mentioned. And, you know, when you when you can't have him, it, it's always, you know, like, man, I wish Langston Love was out here. But at the end of the day, you know, that's when his he expects his teammates, Langston Love expects his teammates to step up and fill his shoes. And that's what we've been doing these last couple of games without him. Um, Dave is doing an amazing job with Langston. Um, just can't wait for Dave to, to say, you know, he's ready to go. Mm-hmm. And we just praying for him. And, you know, he's a tough kid and a great leader for us. And we're just excited to have him on the team and having to be a part of the team. But, you know, a, a player like Langston is always missed for sure when he's not on the floor. Tweety Carter, do players come to you more for basketball questions and information or for things about life? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, and I, and I, I take that to heart. Um uh, you know, these guys are awesome. They always ask some questions. They always seeking knowledge. And, you know, I learn from them a lot. Sometimes I ask those guys questions, you know. Um, and I think th- that that family atmosphere that we have here at Baylor now is, is just unbelievable because those guys are always trying to get better. They don't take much. They don't take things personal. And that's always fun to be around and be able to uh, give uh, you know, criticism to them on how to get better and what they, what they need to improve on. And they take it well and they try to do those things. So, you know, I think our staff do a great job of, you know, talking to them, talking to all the players and trying to figure out how to be better um, for the players and the players figure out how to, how to be better on the court um, for this program. And I think everybody's trying their hardest to, to be better each and every day. So we all learn from each other. How do you describe how fast the game is in front of you where you're not really in control of it because you're not out there with the ball? So you have to watch it happen. How fast is all that going on in front of you? Um, it's, it's At first, when I first uh, got on staff, you know, it was a little different, um, you know, watching it. But now I'm settled into my role on the team, and I really enjoy watching them play. So it's not it's not as fast as it was when I first came on, but – now everything's slowing down, and, you know, I just really enjoy watching them play. But sometimes, you know, i got to uh, refocus and make sure I'm, I'm looking at things that I could help them whenever coach, you know, call a timeout or it's a media timeout, um, just making sure I'm on point uh, to, to share some information and knowledge uh, with the players and the staff. Baylor goes past this weekend and beyond because of what? Of why? Well, well I'm going to tell you this. We're going to stay prayed up. And we got one game on Friday, and that's all we're thinking about right now is Colgate because this is a tough team um, that you that we very much respect, and you know we're going to do our job in preparing for them, and hopefully God bless us to, to to play fast Friday. But Friday is the main focus right now. What toothpaste do you use, Colgate or something else? <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. That is a great question. I'm 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 not into. Uh, I don't know ex- exactly the name of my toothpaste because my wife buys it. So <laughs> you probably would have to call my wife, David. On that one. <laughs> yeah, yesterday I sat there and said I was a Crest guy. I went home last <laughs> night, brushed my teeth before going to bed. I went, damn, that's Colgate. I mean, <laughs> oh, there you I go. I know my, my wife buys everything in that house. So Absolutely. there you go. 
Tweedy, <laughs> uh, great, man, always great to talk to you. Good luck with what you guys do to prep for Colgate uh, as you move forward at the game on Friday. Appreciate your time. No, no problem. Appreciate you having me. Tweedy Carter, Baylor Basketball, 365 Sports. And from Tweedy Carter to Tim Brando, Fox Sports, who joins us with so much to talk to as well about, as we always do, Craig Smoke, Paul Catalina as well. Tim, thanks for your patience. We appreciate your time. Uh, you know Scott Drew. We had him on last week, and he said he was at Baylor through and through and wants to win multiple titles here. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a report Jeff Goodman said that he had confirmed with Drew that he's not going anywhere. Louisville was, of course, there was some smoke there, but I never thought it was legitimate. Your thoughts about the decision that really doesn't surprise any of us here? Well, I mean, Baylor is a premium job, and and Louisville has been up and down for, you know, a while now. And I don't think the ACC can hold a, a candle uh, to the Big 12 right now when it comes to college basketball. And uh, without question, uh, I might be a little bit biased because uh, we're we're just, you know, now I'm just one more season away from getting to come to Big 12 territory for some college basketball. So uh, we look forward to it coming to Fox. Um, you may have noticed we were doing some uh-huh. Big 12 women basketball this past year and uh i think that was just sort of a precursor to sort of let the league know and the league wanted us to be you know somewhat involved in some big 12 uh games here and there whenever possible on the on the women's side and i actually did that baylor texas game the one that they won back in late december so <clears throat> i'll admit to the fact that yeah i'm i'm excited about coming back to the big 12 and i had my time in the acc and got a lot of contacts there but I mean, this is an embarrassing day for them, the way Virginia performed last night against Colorado State, and uh, not a good day for the committee either. Uh, I had the committee's back a little bit uh, because when you have five bids stolen, there's really little they can do given the the current makeup uh, of the, the way the selection process is handled with the 36 teams and the 32 teams on the automatic bid and, and at-large side, but the, the metrics even for Virginia did not measure up to Indiana State's or St. John's or Seton Hall's. Um, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a bad day uh, if you're Jim Phillips in the ACC and you're the uh, NCAA Tournament Selection Committee. I, I, I could defend them to a point, but uh, that was a debacle last night uh, at the first four. Yeah, the, f- the football team would have loved 14 points and a half this year uh, at Virginia. Uh, but <laughs> that was that was the Iowa Hawkeyes offensive version yes. of basketball. Yeah, it, it was. Tim, yeah. uh, why do the power brokers in college basketball not understand that the tournament is as perfect as it can get <clears> and they can't keep their beefy mitts off of it? Meaning meaning we're going to go to 80? Is that what you're telling yeah, me? Yeah, they're talking about expansion. They're doing all well, this. I mean, Last night yeah. proved that expansion's probably not the best thing. No, but it's going to be the only thing mm-hmm. because, you know, they're going to be these commissioners and these athletic directors of these schools that were left out, okay, whether you're in the Missouri Valley Conference or the Big East, okay? Um, Big East was the second best league in America this year. Only the Big 12 was better. But because they had three teams, all with similar resumes, all hovered around either in or just outside the bubble, they all got hammered. And that's one of the reasons why I was not critical when, you know, even Patino said what he did about the net. Listen, he he didn't say that college basketball's selection process was fraudulent. He said the net was fraudulent. You know, and yet some people were going off on Rick. That was a little bit like uh, people going off on on, – uh, the bloodbath statement made by Trump, we know he was talking about the auto situation, the auto, the car situation. He wasn't talking about a bloodbath. I mean, it, it, the same thing is happening in sports now with the media. They, they go after fraudulent coming from Patino's mouth. He was talking about the net. The net was supposed to be irrefutable. It was supposed to replace the RPI, the ratings percentage index, and, and really offer us all the answers we need. You can talk to to Scott, you can talk to any college basketball coach or the SIDs of any of these schools, and every time a broadcast team would come in, we would be double-checking with them, where are you in the net? Where are you in the net? Yeah, that's the number one question during the course of the regular season. The net clearly didn't mean as much because had it, I think um, I think Seton Hall and St. John's probably would have been in. Virginia would have been out. But, 
you know, this is the way the politics works, to your point. I don't want to go to 80 any more than you want us to go to 80. But this is how it all works. Okay, Sankey's behind it. You know, he's going to get Petiti to get behind it, and we're going to go to 80. I'm just, just mark it down. That's going to happen. Um, I'd rather see the regular season move back. I would rather see uh, the conference championships be more meaningful, which clearly they were, right? Teams, they had to pay attention this year to, to what happened in the conference championships because there was so much bid stealing, okay? When NC State did what it did, Oregon did what it did. So on the one hand, it was a good thing, but it was a bad thing because right now that just gives those people you're talking about the ammunition to get what they want, and that's expansion to 80. Tim, uh, you've covered so many different events, and, and so I could point to probably any month on the calendar and say what kind of memories come flooding back. But with March and March Madness and college basketball, uh, does this time of year bring back some special memories for you and kind of what comes to mind? Oh, my God. I mean, there's so many. Uh, buzzer beaters that I will always remember, and you'll see them pop up on those um, – on the X uh, or Twitter, if you prefer still calling it that, hmm. where they look back on this date in, you know, or 2008, on this date in uh, 1998, this date in 2003 or four. I mean, I, there's so many of them. Uh, you know, Tom Izzo is, you know, he's had uh, uh, eight Final Fours, 12 Sweet Sixteens, uh, and now what is it, 26 consecutive NCAAs. And I've had a couple of his great runs, uh, including that great buzzer beater to go to the Sweet 16 uh, when they beat Gravis Vasquez in Maryland. I want to say that was in the 2009, maybe 10 season. Might have been 2010. And um, Corey Lucius hit the shot. And if Draymond Green, Draymond Green throws the ball with two seconds left and almost hits Delvon Rowe, Rowe right in the head. Rowe was smart enough to duck because he didn't want to shoot it. But the little guard, Corey Lucius, who the following year transferred to Iowa State, hit the shot to get them into the Sweet 16. They went on to the Final Four yet again. Um, you got to have moments like that for it to happen. Uh, in 2008, uh, right after the tornado hit the Georgia Dome in the middle of our broadcast of the SEC tournament, uh, the following week we were assigned to Tampa, and Mike Jaminski and I went in there for the first and only time in the history of the NCAA tournament the teams that were lower seated, that were wearing the darker uniforms, that were at the same bench, won every game. There were literally, according to the seeds, upsets in every game. It started with a Ty Rogers shot from almost half court to beat a 30 win Drake team. It continued with San Diego uh, with only about two or three seconds left winning their game against fourth seeded UConn. That was uh, Jim Calhoun's team. Uh, that lost that game. It would uh, it would later go on, as you know, the following year to be a favorite and lose to Michigan State in nine uh, in Detroit in the Final Four. But they were a hell of a team uh, just a year away. They got knocked out in the first round at that site. Uh, uh, Villanova was making its uh, its its run with those great guards, and um, you know they took down a Clemson team that a lot of people thought was maybe the best Clemson team to get in the tournament in forever. And Siena, uh, McCaffrey was coaching them at that time, beat a Vanderbilt team that had been impressive all year. About one of the last really good teams Vanderbilt ever had. Um, so those four things, four teams all won, and that was uh, memorable to say the least. But the 98 uh, final, uh, regional final in, in St. Louis with Al McGuire is the one I'll always remember and treasure the most because – uh, it was the first time I got a chance to, to punch a ticket for a team all the way to the Final Four. And I was working with the great Al McGuire, seashells and balloons, uh, passing out toy soldiers to people, including me. And I was working really with the last great icon of college basketball analysts that I, that I dreamed of working with. You know, I grew up watching Al win a national title when I was 21, then go to NBC, work with Enberg and, and Billy Packer. And, of course, I'd already worked with Billy Packer. I'd already worked with Bill Raftery and Dick Vitale. So, you know, Al was the, uh, you know, he was the cherry on top for me to get a chance to work with him. And we lost him only about three years later. So uh, to have that on my resume and to have that memory of, you know, really the last month of the season spent with the great Al McGuire is, 
you know, I'll, 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 I'll never be able to equal that no matter how many great games I have in my future and how many Hall of Fame analysts I have the opportunity to work with. I'm glad you went there because I saw on your Twitter feed on uh, announcer schedules and 20 years ago, CBS, <laughs> my yeah. good Lundquist, Harlan, Nance, Ian Eagle, um, Gus Johnson, Dick Enberg, of course, Tim Enberg. Brando, uh, Craig Bowlerjack. I mean, and uh, that doesn't include the greatness of, uh, as you mentioned, Rafferty, Packer, others. Yeah, yeah. Man. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of depth at that time. And, and uh, you know, the only reason I lost the second weekend uh, was because uh, we got the NFL back on CBS uh, in 97 and 8. We were without. Uh, the National Football League. They had lost it to uh, Fox in 94. And I didn't join up until 96 at CBS. But those opportunities were created because people like Dick Stockton, uh, Summerall, and a lot of other talent had left and gone to Fox. And uh, Enberg was at NBC still. He had just done the Super Bowl in 97. And, uh, you know, for NBC. Then they lost the AFC package, uh, that right after that, and by 99, Enberg was joining CBS. Vern was coming back from Turner, where he had gone uh, after CBS had lost the NFL. And so, you know, we're talking two Hall of Famers right there, and, and my position in the fourth hole uh, was, was demoted back down to, I think it was sixth or seventh at that particular time. And uh, Gus had not yet emerged. Gus Gus emerged right around that time, and he started getting all these great games. I think I had the I had the sixteen one game in ninety six when Western Carolina had three looks at beating a number one seed Purdue in Albuquerque. Uh, and as great as that game was, and it was off the charts good, uh, at the very same time that my game was going on, Gus had Princeton's upset of the defending national champion Bruins of UCLA. I want to say that was being played in Indianapolis in a packed house at the Dome. I was at the pit in Albuquerque. And uh, it was just, you know, I, I, I probably had as many great uh, moments as just about anybody uh, in the early rounds and in the Sweet 16, except Gus. Gus had just an inordinate number of great games. And he became a, an internet cult hero. It really built his career. It really did. He and I have talked about it often. Um, so I think he's probably, a, a, you know, if you, if you ran a, if you ran a, uh, a, a, a poll, uh, of which CBS announcers on the NCAAs, you missed the most Gus would it be at the top because he, he had so many great finishes. Um, I'd be somewhere in that neighborhood. Probably some people would mention me, but, but Gus had just an incredible number of, uh, of upsets and big time games during that same period. Tim, you mentioned Billy Packer. He was, to fans, very controversial uh, yep. because you know that, like you know, he he was uh, unabashedly himself during a broadcast, yep. which is what makes broadcasters good most of the time. Um, yeah. What was it like being? Did you enjoy being next to someone who was controversial? Oh God, yes! Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> it took heat off me because by, by play-by-play standards, uh, I think you'd have to agree I'm controversial. <laughs> I'm not just a time and temperature, yep. just all the game jack guy. Um, I, I'm a guy that that hopes to elevate the guy that's working with him by saying what's obvious. You know, you know if I'm if I'm if I'm calling a game and I see a defensive change to, you know, full court two, two, one pressure. You know, I'm going to say that. All right. I, I'm going to say that. Now some might say, well, that's, that's for the analyst to say, no, I'm calling the game. I see what they're doing in real time. I'm going to say it. So what does that mean? It means the guy working next to me, whoever he is, it could be Mike Jeminski for 10 years. It could be Dan Bonner. It could be uh, Al McGuire, whoever. If I say that, then that means they got to tell me something else. They got to come up with a reason why they went to the two two one zone press. They're supposed to be the why guy. I'm the fact guy. I'm the I say what I see guy. So I see that I say it, and now they got to tell me what the effects of that two two one are, or why did they go to the two two one zone press? And that makes the analyst a better analyst. Um, 
Now, that's just the way I do it. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, and when I say that, I don't mean just um, uh, the viewer, but sometimes the executive that's make, making the business, uh, making the changes with the announcers. And maybe maybe he would prefer I, I did keep my mouth shut and let the analyst say that. But I've always tried to elevate the role of the analyst, make that analyst better. And I think that if I say two, two, one, then it's up to the analyst. He's, he's now cornered. He's got to tell me why, not just that they're in it. If the analyst just says they're in it, then what is he really telling us? I want to know why they're in it. And so if I say it, then they're going to have to incorporate why, why, when they react to what I'm doing. Um, and, and uh, if there are issues that are taking place both on the floor or just a reaction to this or that call that a player or a coach might make, if I see or hear something, I'm going to make a comment on it. I'm not just going to disregard it. And um, so, you know, what we do is subjective. Uh, and as I said, uh, some people prefer um, maybe less being more. And I try, I try really hard. I do think I talk less now in my games than I did 30 years ago or even 20 years ago. But when I do say something, I think I'm saying it because I feel like you need to know it. Tim, uh, we saw the note last week about the college football playoff, the payout, the distribution. Yeah. I think everyone kind of knew this was coming. Uh, and yet when you see the numbers themselves, and I know Washington State, Oregon State got a bump from what was reported to like three and a half mm -hmm. million. But yeah. were you surprised by some of the differences in the percentage from the S SEC Big Ten dropping to the ACC and then then the Big 12? I'm a little surprised by a lot of things, fellas. I mean, I am. Um, uh, and again, um, full disclosure, I'm a little surprised and, and maybe maybe a little disappointed that based on the reports we see, it appears that uh, the so-called sub-licensing or um, selling off of some of these games from ESPN to other networks, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. And it looks like they're going to carry all, all of it. Okay. I don't think that's in the best interest of college football. That's my opinion. I don't speak for anyone at Fox other than myself. Um, I think in the aftermath of the way this past year's college football playoff was handled or mishandled, um, I think uh, America really wanted to see more than just one carrier uh, for, for the, the, the college football playoff. And based on the reports we're seeing, okay, all of them, frankly, coming from, from the worldwide leader, um, that they're going to have it all. So I congratulate them. Good for them. Uh, but I, frankly, just from the outside looking in, um, I don't know how in the world they plan on making money with it. Uh, I, <laughs> not based on 50 million per game. Uh, and with a lot of those games being in the month of December, opposite NFL playoff games, NFL regular season games, it's going to be a very crowded universe. And, um, whereas if you had more than one carrier for the convenience sake of that, of, of the different networks that could be involved, whether it was the one I work for or NBC or CBS, you could, uh, you could tailor it more appropriately so you could maximize your audience. Um, I think that when it, with it's just being one, you, you got an issue and that's even with them having, uh, you know, ESPN two and news, uh, all the other different platforms that they have. Um, uh, so I'm surprised by that. Um, and again, good for them. Um, but I'm, I'm a little disappointed for college football because I think it would have been, um, you know, really a, a, a very good for the sport to have a blueprint similar to that of the NFL, where multiple uh, networks are involved and everybody's talking about it as opposed to, you know, one carrier. Um, as for the, the, the money distribution, I did see this happen. I think the last time I was with you guys, uh, I was shouting down the notion of a guaranteed three, you know, that you had to have a guaranteed three spots for the Big Ten and the SEC. I thought that was something that maybe their presidents were forcing the commissioners of the SEC and the Big Ten to do. It just made no sense. Public relations wise, it just looked bad. And I noticed that they backed off of that. Um, they, they shouldn't be guaranteed because the metrics alone will get them three in. There's no sense in rubbing everybody else's nose in it by saying they're guaranteed three or that the ACC is guaranteed two. Um, so I think they did back off that, which was good. As for the revenue distribution, 
you know, they, they hold the cards. The SEC and the Big Ten hold the cards, and uh, they, they earned that with the leverage that they were able to create. But I, I, I'm hoping, uh, because, you know, something about our business that never changes has changed. So I'm hoping that sometime between now and that deal being executed, whenever that happens to be, I hope that they find a way to see, see it through that 14 is not where you want to be. You know, you got two plus years to figure out that if you want to make the money that you think you want to make and you want your partners to be happy, you, you need to go to 16 and you need to have more than one carrier involved. And that can be through sub licensing. It can be through whatever. But I think that um, I think that that would be the way to go uh, and not have two teams uh, getting buys. Uh, we just, you know, the, the 14 team idea because they could go to it and they could probably do it and be able to afford it with one carrier. I mean, I think that's what this was about. Let's go to 14 and then we can, we can hold all of it ourselves. I think, uh, I think that's foolhardy. I think going to 16 and going to 16 now with the understanding that you're going to be at 12 for the next two years. And then by the time you get to 16, maybe it becomes more consumer friendly uh for the for the partners the network partners because now i i just think that's a lot of money to be paying for games involving teams that uh probably lost three games you know in that opening round i i think that's that's potentially problematic but again there's a lot of time between now and then and as i said before i only speak for myself not for not for the company i work for Tim, what is the end game for the ACC now that uh, Clemson has joined the lawsuit fray? <laughs> God. Man, well, the, the wheels are going to be turning. And I think that what it, what it really means is uh, by the time we get to that, uh, th- that point in two years, in 2026, I think it means the landscape's going to be a lot different, fellas. Okay. Uh, Brother Smoke and Catalina, trust me when I tell you, I think that's where we're <laughs> headed. Okay, I think that you're going to see uh, those members in the ACC, like um, North Carolina, like Virginia, um, potentially Miami, but certainly those two, Carolina and Virginia, without a doubt. Uh, you're going to be seeing them heading to the Big Ten. You're going to see Florida State, Clemson, uh, maybe Miami, we'll see. Miami could go either way, I think, uh, headed to the SEC. I, I, I just see trouble. And, and then you're going to have Stanford and Cal trying to find a, a, a home again because how do they fit into a, a, an ACC that's uh, just when they thought they were expanding, they might be imploding. Yeah, that, that's what it looks like to me. Uh, it all comes back down to what, uh, the law, what happens with the lawsuit. And uh, – Clemson now sees that Florida State's lawyers are thinking that they can get what they need to get done done. Uh, that does not bode well for the future of the Atlantic Coast Conference. So you watched some Big 12 games. As you mentioned, you did the game when Baylor was down early and came back to beat Texas, and they dig themselves a hole. It seemed like constantly Baylor does. Both teams were in the tournament. Both have been somewhat erratic. Texas has a bunch of playmakers, you would think, with a, a lot of experience. Your thoughts about either one of those teams as they enter the tournament? Well, I, I honestly, I think that um, the problem the problem that both these teams have is the draw. You know, I, I do like – we're talking about the men, right? We're yes, talking sir. About yeah, the, yes, sir. Okay. Um, because the game I had that I think you might have been referencing was the women's game that oh, okay. I had between okay. – In Texas. Um, that Baylor won at Texas, by the way. I And, and I think – by the, and let me just tell you now, on the women's side, that's the overlooked team. On the women's side is Texas. Okay. Uh, I think that team could go all the way to the final four, maybe even win it uh, the way they've been playing of late. But um, on the men's side, the the problem I see for Baylor is they're on the same side of the bracket with Arizona. And eventually they're going to have to play them. I do think they can get to the second weekend. Uh, I like that. And I think that that's good for Scott and uh, his team has got the firepower in my opinion. And uh, if, their, if their defense can stay where it's been, uh, continue to improve, I think they'll be all right. Texas, in my mind, is just – I, I, I don't like their draw, and I think they're probably going to be bounced pretty soon. 
in this year's NCAAs. Uh, the Big 12 has got a lot going for it, and it's got a lot of teams that 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 could be, and, I, and maybe I'm wrong. Let me, let me tell you, when it comes to this thing, <laughs> I mean, you're better off talking to somebody that's picking teams based on yep. how good looking the coach or what color uniforms uh, they prefer. You know, my wife could probably beat me right now by the end of the week on teams she's got left in her bracket versus me. But uh, I just think this thing this year, fellas, is set up for an incredible run of uh, retribution and redemption from the committee snubbing the Big East of their three teams that should have been in that weren't. And the three teams that are left all got great draws, with the exception of UConn with the four conference tournament yep. champions on their side. Iowa State's got a great shot. Illinois has got a great shot. Auburn's got a great shot. But I don't think any of them can beat UConn. I think UConn doesn't care who they play. They prefer being in Brooklyn and Boston than any place else, and they'll take on all comers. But I think Arizona's in a great position to get through. I like Michigan State to get to the round of 16. I think Izzo's going to do it again in the opening weekend and get to the round of 16 uh, before they have to play uh, Arizona. Um, and the other team I've got, I think UConn, Creighton, and Marquette are going to the Final Four. I think we're going to see three Big East teams in the Final Four. I love Creighton's draw because with Ryan Kalkbrenner, they've got exactly the right guy to defend Edie without having to give help. And uh, with Tyler Colick coming back to Marquette, I think that's a problem for Houston because with Colick, now Cam Jones can go back off the ball. Colick can run his, uh, his pick and rolls with Oso Iguodaro. And you look at guys like Chase Ross and, uh, and uh, Ben Gold and all these other guys that can really stroke it, I think it's going to allow them to go back and play the way they want to play. And uh, Sean Miller's a hell of a coach. So that's my big splash uh, with, my, with my tournament selection is that I like all three Big East teams that are conveniently a one seed, a two seed, and a three seed all making it to the big dance in Arizona. I do have UConn and Creighton. Uh, Creighton, uh, of course, who knocked Baylor out last year. I have both right. of them. I mean, my- that, that team basically, I mean, that team basically was one second and one bad call away from being at a Final Four for a second straight year. So they know, you know how to navigate it to a point where they can get to the, the Final Four. They, just, they had to get used to not having Ryan Nimhart at point guard. I think they have the Ashworth kid, along with Trey Alexander, uh, and listen, Baylor Shireman could have, maybe even should have been the Big East player of the year. That kid is a stud. And I think uh, Purdue's going to have all kinds of problems trying to defend all those outstanding scores that uh, Greg McDermott has. I really think, I think Matt Painter deserves to go to a Final Four. I wanted them to go to a Final Four. I think Lance Jones was a great addition. Braden Smith's played great, but I don't think they've got the firepower uh, if Creighton is playing their game to beat them. Tim, I, somebody in the chat room just asked this question because we have you on video, and it's great to do that. Mm-hmm. And all the stuff you have in the background, I've asked you about it before. Uh-huh. Do you remember or is it impossible to remember one of the first collectibles you ever started putting in your office behind you? Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of stuff is uh, personal stuff right. that I've acquired over time, uh, gifts, things that were given to me. But um, – like, for instance, I'm going to show you this real quick. This is a uh, – I was doing a uh, fundraising speech at Western Georgia. An old coach mm. named uh, Ed Murphy that coached at Ole Miss had me come and speak. He was the athletic director there. And that's in uh, West uh, – right off of I-20 near LaGrange, uh, Georgia. And so I'm at a silent auction. And at this silent auction, there was an Islamic prayer book. Now you say, Brando, what is a guilty Catholic doing with <laughs> an Islamic prayer book? Well, I got it because it was a silent auction. No one had bid on, and it was signed by Muhammad Ali. No, oh, okay, <laughs> okay. And I mean, I got it for like next to nothing. It was I, I, I got to get this. And of course, as time went on, uh, I started. I actually kind of looked at it a few times. You know, I, I I told I'll never forget. I told Chris Jackson, the former LSU player, now. Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. I said I picked up a Islamic prayer book, and he told me something about it. And so I looked at it, and I learned a few things. So that's that's one. But I think the one that might impress you the most. Let me uh, let me grab it. Okay, yeah, take, and, I, and I did yeah. get it, and I got it 
at a uh, uh, at a celebrity golf tournament uh, that was connected to the um, the Jimmy V uh, okay. in North Carolina. And so they had a they had an auction. I wanted to make a contribution to the to the foundation. So you know, I got it, and and, and maybe because I'd done the uh, I'd done the uh, NBA playoffs. It was during that period, you know, when Jordan was coming back. When Michael was coming back mm -hmm. after Houston had won those two NBA championships with the Dream Shake and uh, Kenny Smith and those guys had won yep. back to back years in '95 and '96, uh, if memory serves me correctly. So I got this. All right, let me, All right. Let me grab it. All right. Uh, you don't. You don't. It's hard to find one of these. <laughs> Just for you, Smoke. <laughs> Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> Holy smokes. Yeah. And when you get one of these, and I got one of these, it was a thrill because I got to call his games uh, in the NBA. And, and I'll, the, 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 the second buzzer beater he hit when he returned, wearing the number, number 45, not 23, right. uh, was over Steve Smith and the Hawks. Wow. And uh, I made the Sports Illustrated year in review with my call of that shot. So I have a place, a warm place in my heart for Jordan. So, well, there you go. A lot of people do. Well, we have one follow-up question. If you had to move, which I know you don't want to, but if you had to move, who would take longer to pack up their stuff? Your office? Oh, or, oh, 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 wait a minute. Oh, we wait are family. We are family. I got a question about this. This, is, this was given to me when I was calling Braves games by Phil Garner. Uh -huh. when he was managing the Astros, and Scrap Iron's a friend. And I had told him that I played in high school with uniforms that looked just like his, black and gold, just like the Pirates. And so the next time I went in there, he had this for me and he signed it. Man, that so. was, we, we are family, I guess, back with so Star Jones. We are family yeah. when it's done, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So if it took you a time, if you had to move, who would have the room that would take the longest to pack? Yours or something that is your wife's favorite room? Oh, my. Mine, mine, <laughs> not even close. I'm the high maintenance one in our family. She's very low maintenance. You know, she's, uh, she's the practical one. Um, yeah, it's kind of a role reversal, Yeah, you know, with us. So she's like, oh, Tim, you don't need that. Oh, yeah, honey, I got to have that. Yep. <laughs> well, we, we, That's we, kind of the way we uh, roll. I, when it I, comes to I, sports I memorabilia, yeah. when it comes to sports memorabilia, I'm, I'm really that way. Tim, as always, uh, thank you for a trip down memory lane with March Madness and everything else in between the opinions on all the other things that continue to go on in college athletics. Uh, everybody in the chat room loves the segment. We do, too. Appreciate your time, and we'll talk to you again soon. You got it. Oh, by the way, here's one last one. The great Jim Simpson of Jim uh, Simpson. ESPN and NBC fame, and that's him meeting my daughter Tiffany in my first year of calling games on ESPN, Vital and Simpson came into a game at LSU right after I'd done my first games at ESPN. He came to my house for dinner, and and there he is uh, giving my wife a handshake, and he had just hugged my daughter Tiffany, who's now 41 years old. So did, that's a. Do you still have that awesome suit? Which one? The one in the picture. One? The one in the picture. Oh man! Oh, that's a sports coat. That I can fit in now. Oh, are you, you serious? Know, I've, dropped, yeah. I've dropped fifty-five pounds since last since last year. You know, so yeah. Hey, that's that, that's uh, eighty-five right wow. there. So oh, that's vintage. I yeah. mean, I I haven't weighed uh, I haven't weighed uh, two fifteen or two ten. I'm I'm down to you know I've, I've I lost uh, from two seventy to two fifty-five pounds. So I, that's I'm, awesome. Uh, I was able to do that. So, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it's got it's got a little lint on it now, so I probably <laughs> wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. You can wear I it. Wear it. Yeah. Uh, and, and the and the tones of Jim Simpson. That's awesome. And yours too, Tim. Thank you so much, buddy. Can't wait to talk to you again soon. You got it. All Thank the best, you. fellas. Tim Bye -bye. Brando, Fox Sports, with his opinions and also memories uh, of many things when it comes to college sports and also March Madness and even some of his memorabilia. Retired stockbroker asked that question about packing up that room. When we come back, uh, we'll have Paul Catalina's top five, Katie Rader with a super chat. By the way, Katie Rader, good luck to the Red Raiders. Great interview, fellas. Thank you. We appreciate that, too. Alan Samuels, Dodge Chrysler Jeep Ram Fiat in Waco, is not only your full-line Dodge Chrysler Jeep Ram dealer, but also some nice 
pre-owned cars available. I bought mine on their lot in 2020 when I was looking around. I looked at a lot of different cars. AJ was walking me around the lot, and then all of a sudden, off from the distance, I just loved the way the front, the grill, the look of a Ford Explorer that I bought there, a pre-owned car. Extra clean, a one-owner 2023 Mercedes-Benz GLC 300, sleek and sexy, with only 19,000 miles available, 37,845. 2024 Ford Mustang leather seats automatic loaded up, under 1,000 miles available for just under 37,000. Here's one, the 2024 Ford Mustang leather seats, automatic. Well, that's the one I just mentioned, the 2023 Ford Ranger FX four off-road package. One owner looks like it's brand new under 15,000 miles for just under 40,000. 2024 Ford Explorer, the one that I bought, not that same year, but I love it. Leather seats, sunroof, one owner. The 2021 Nissan Kicks, great little car. Fuel mileage for 18,000 365. These are just some of the examples of an incredible list of pre-owned cars that Ted Teague and the great people at Alan Samuels, Dodge Chrysler, Jeep Ram, Fiat have. The last one, not the only one left, the 2022 Jeep Wagoneer. I've told you about that vehicle. Three, a Series 3 with 44,000 miles, one owner, 58,550. All sorts of sizes ready for you right now, ready to be delivered to you right now. Alan Samuels, Dodge Chrysler, Jeep Ram, Fiat, Loop 340 east of 84 in Waco. On April 8th, between 11 and 3 at Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness on Lakeshore Drive in Waco, Far Out Solar Eclipse Day. Central Texas is one of the places where you have an unobstructed view of the solar eclipse. April the 8th, 11 to 3, Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness. Members and guests enjoy special open play for tennis and pickleball. $5 guest fee instead of what normally is 10 throughout the day, including enjoying group exercise classes, weight room, which is spectacular, tennis and pickleball ball courts and complimentary solar eclipse eyewear local true jamaican food truck available 11 to 2 live band on the patio outside on the concourse in the back with jay smith and the wesson from 12 to 2 take advantage of the unobstructed view from the stadium court at Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness. Beer and wine available for sale. Family, friendly, and fun. The Far Out Solar Eclipse Day, April the 8th, 11 to 3. Specials for both members and guests at Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness on Lakeshore Drive in Waco. Rev up your excitement. Celebrate the spirit of adventure during the Jeep Celebration event. Join us at Allen Samuels in Waco as we roll out incredible deals on rugged and reliable Jeep vehicles you love. Seize the moment and drive home in the new Jeep of your dreams with special financing options and exclusive offers there has never been a better time to explore the world of jeep hurry in the savings won't last long visit alan samuels dcj.com and see them firsthand only at alan samuels and waco let your adventure begin come by let's be friends at Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be a part of the Waco community. We're a small family business right here in Central Texas, and our goal is to bring down the cost of health care while maintaining high quality. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important, and unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. That's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through the difficult time. We offer premium MRIs just like a hospital with state-of-the-art technology and specialists, but you'll pay less. Sometimes thousands of dollars less, whether you're using insurance or not. At Ideal MRI, we accept most insurance and there are no hidden costs. Even offering financing if that's needed, everything included in the price, and you'll not get something as a surprise in the mail later on. If you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. They'll know. You can schedule an appointment safely from home online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or give us a call, 833-IDEAL-MRI, Ideal MRI. MRI.com. TFNB, your bank for life, is the official local bank of Baylor Athletics. Find out why more Central Texans are making TFNB their bank for life. Sign up for our Edge checking and savings accounts to earn interest or cash back. With five convenient locations and an award-winning mobile app, banking has never been easier. TFNB, your bank for life. Member FDIC. Want to know why Stonewood Dental is so successful? Listen to what happy customers have to say. 
pleasant. It's different than any other dentist's office. I really feel like they care. And it's not that you're here for two hours waiting on someone to take care of you. It's quick and easy, and you know, I bring my kids, and my kids love being here too. They really love the treasure box. <laughs> Staff is really nice and accommodating, real friendly. You feel more like home. It's not sterile looking. Everybody has their own personalized rooms with decorations and decor, and they'll even have a blanket for you when it's cold. <laughs> I've recommended people to actually come here, and they are patients now. I really love it here. It feels like family. Learn more, stonewood-dental.com. Time for Paul Catalina's Top 5, brought to you by Texas Beef House. Where's the best beef in Texas? Your house when you order from Texas Beef House. Unleash the flavor of Texas raised Wagyu. From our pasture to your plate, TexasBeefHouse.com. Top 5 thoughts on the crisis in the ACC, and it certainly is that. I don't want to be hyperbolic, but they are facing down a crisis, and... It is obviously different because this one's in the light of day as where every other, you know, uh, transfer or uh, conference realignment thing is under cover of night. But this, like, if you go back in the history of this and you look at John Swafford to Jim Phillips, I've got a lot of Larry Scott, uh, George Klyovkov vibes here. Jim Phillips may be a little bit more in control because he's got this long TV deal, but the decisions along the way kind of feel very similar. Like it's, it's, I'm sure that Clemson and Florida state are, we're watching the PAC 12 and going like, other than this TV deal, there's a lot of things involved here, but number five, the ACC really doesn't want to know who else wants out. So if they had a, you know, should we have a vote on, you know, who should we sue or should we do a lawsuit? The problem is that there'd be some people there who are like, yeah, I don't know if you should do one. And then you find out like, oh, you've probably even got a bigger problem than you want to look in the face. Even though you know that, like having that reality that Virginia and North Carolina could be in this, or even though Miami was a, you know, is against Florida State leaving the conference right now, if they're out, their ideas could change. All of those things, it would be it would be a stark dose of reality to the ACC if they found out what if they did how everybody draw. really felt. If they did a blind draw where the names of the logos were not on, who was on this side of the table they didn't want to know? Uh, I think that even still they would have some numbers yeah, that wouldn't, yeah. you know. At least an idea. Well, here's the thing is they know at least part of who wants out because of what happened earlier last year. Mm -hmm. uh, Clemson and Florida State are the obvious, but uh, there was all of the reports surrounding Miami and North Carolina obviously is uh, what I think Ross Dellinger described as a linchpin in this entire mm -hmm. thing, like the the – Jenga piece that you could pull that craters the entire game. Uh, NC State, we know the the back and forth there on the state of North Carolina, and then the two Virginia schools, Virginia and Virginia Tech. So at least at one point in time, it was known that those were the magnificent seven that were yeah. involved in in wanting out. So, yeah, I mean, is there some others to add to that list? Uh, is it all still those same schools? I mean, clearly Florida State and Clemson have – have been as public as they possibly can. But, yeah, if you're the ACC, I think you're just kind of clutching your pearls and waiting for potentially another shoe to drop, and then how many keep dropping and dropping and dropping, and how long does that list become as this all plays out? Yeah. Number four, after the CFP announcement, how could this not happen? I mean, honestly, like, that was because saying out loud by that contract that you are worth less – then the Big Ten gives Clemson the ammo they need to jump on the other side and to come out of the shadows. That's the thing that I think it had to be, and I'm sure Jim Phillips maybe even saw this coming, in that as soon as they hear this, then Clemson has what they, ha what they need to deal with their people. Because I think that's part of it with Clemson. Because Florida State can be out there and loud and, you know, the fans of Clemson can be like, ah, oh, those jerks. You know, like they're always causing trouble or they're always this way. And then you don't want to be like, you don't want to see, seem to be completely aligned with them. You've got to wait for the, the PR tide to turn. And then as it turns over the months, 
you can be you have people going, well, why aren't we in on this? Or how do we feel about this? And they they've been very quiet. And then when you find out, like, oh, you're getting half the money that the Big Ten is, then they can be like, well, now, no, now you know how we feel about this. Whether it's right or wrong, that I think is 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 a huge part of this. This is what's so weird to me, though, is how rigged up this all is. Yeah. Because ESPN or other networks control how much they're making and will mm-hmm. continue to control how much they're making because mm-hmm. they're going to make whatever is offered to well, them. And, and so and they can the intentionally... Only Tim just said it. They're yeah. the only network. Yeah, and so they can intentionally lowball them to force mm-hmm. members to want mm-hmm. to get it. And it's like, it just makes you... It's like I said a, a couple weeks ago, whoever came up with the start of this grand plan... Like, you couldn't have predicted every way that it's played out because some moves were forced by other moves happening, like Texas and Oklahoma. We weren't supposed to find out about that when we found out about that. Mm-hmm. That was just somebody leaking to Brent Zorneman, and then all hell broke loose. Um, but, yeah, like, it's just – it's really weird how – the strings are pulled behind the scenes and how those who stand to benefit the most are also the ones in controls of the levers. And it, I don't know. Does that make sense? It's yeah. just, it's very strange, but yeah, absolutely. After the announcement about how much the AC or the SEC and the big 10, we're going to get, I mean, again, who's that being offered by the same ones that control the mm. ACC. And they're basically telling them like, you sure you don't want to leave the ACC? You sure we can't convince you to come join the SEC and, and be a part of our brand. So yeah, I mean, it's you like see a those- boss who continues to like, annoy you and frustrate you and downgrade you and eventually he wants you to leave but he's going to make you make that decision yeah basically is what's mm. happening and so yeah they're, they're going to get mad at the big 12 or at the uh you know the whoever and the whole time it's the, their own in their own house that's mm-hmm. pulling all of the strings behind the scenes really but yeah after that was out i mean clearly if you're florida state or clemson you're looking at the money gap and you see how large it is and how much larger it stands to grow and you have already declared how you can't sustain the success that you've had and compete at the highest level if the money figures are going to com- continue to drift apart. And as we saw, there's only more and more and more going into the favor of two leagues, and one of, and neither one is the ACC. So, yeah, it was basically the last straw of like, all right, there's no turning back now. If you all want to stay a part of this club, you better go ahead and make your move. Otherwise, you're going to sit there and, and be relegated, so to speak. Yeah. Number three. How many teams would not have landing spots? And I can tell you right now, it would be a struggle for Boston College, Wake Forest, and SMU right off the bat. Cal and Stanford essentially had to, to beg their way into the league anyway, and there are, there are schools that you would have thought would have landing spots at any other time in college sports, but those three stand out, and SMU... It especially sucks for them because of everything they've given up or tried to do to get into one of these power leagues. And then for this one to turn around and fall apart. All the waiting and having to almost go through hell because of the past. And then you get your chance, and it may not even be there in a couple of years. Yeah, so there's there's three schools that I would say are – those first three I mentioned, SMU, Boston College, and Wake Forest, that would be there in the – not quite maybe in the same, but Oregon State, Washington State category of like, I, I don't know what we're going to do. Right. Um, and then there's a bunch of tweeners that well, I say a bunch, but NC State, Syracuse, St- Stanford, Cal, Virginia Tech, and Georgia Tech would be kind of tweeners. And then I think that, um, you know, and this is just on the ones that are not the the obvious ones that would leave. I would, I would say that uh, Pitt, Louisville, Duke, would have homes for sure because of basketball. I mean, just just for sure. I mean, Pitt in the Big 12 makes so much sense. I wish it would happen tomorrow. Their fans that I see don't seem don't to want seem that, to but that, I don't but, know what your options are going to be yeah. if this all falls through um, the way it is. You know, and, and, and again, Louisville in the Big 12 per, should have probably yeah. already happened years ago. Yeah. But um, – you know they 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 didn't. That's not how it went the, down. So I I mean those those I could see, and then it, and then they go worse with Brett Yormark. If he if you're hot for UConn, man, you'd be really hot for Duke. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. You would think so. Um, yeah. I mean it's I've seen various kind of breakdowns of this, and and various people you know claim or predict how like these will all shake out. I think the most interesting one is Miami, mm-hmm. uh, because there's. Reason to believe, well, that's Miami. They're going to be in the Big Ten of the SEC. It's like, well, not so fast. I don't know, man. I don't yeah. know if it's that automatic. Like, that's not as big of a school as, as probably a lot of people think. Um, and I, I, I just find them to be kind of a fascinating case yeah, they, because they're probably in the 
uh, more in that level with Pitt and Louisville where they're going to wind up somewhere. Yeah, for sure. But it may not be the place that they thought they were going For to. sure, yeah. yeah. And and maybe they do get a Big Ten or SEC invite if it came mm-hmm. to that, but maybe they don't. And yeah. and then and then you're looking at, yeah, like the Big 12. And that would be a tough pill to swallow for South Florida fans, but uh, that might be what the option is. So that, that to me, is a team that you can't really – or I can't seem to really know – like you know kind of for sure on some of these, all but right, not that one. All right, let's, let's say Florida State, Clemson, North Carolina, Carolina, they go somewhere else. Virginia of, would too. Virginia, of all the other ones left, if you could pick your four among the remaining schools, if the Big Twelve could dream and get them, who would they be? Mine, would be, mine would be Louisville, Duke, Pitt, and uh, Miami. Uh, you know what? Yes, yeah, I think that'd be fun. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I'd say, man, that's tough. Um, that'd be fun because I, I feel like there's things that I don't know that would help me in making sure. this like would, sure. if I went and looked and researched a little bit would NC State suddenly be one of those four yeah you know maybe, like yeah. and so and by the way if you're a fan of some of the teams yeah, we're, we're, not, talking, we're not trying to yeah. like dismiss you Judging. we're just, just uh, uh, kind of just talking amongst ourselves believe here. us over here in this corner of the college football conference world we're not judging anybody no, else's no, conference no, and realignment and any I've of been that. there and again, a lot I don't want to like I ideally would just like if Florida State and Clemson are going to leave, I think for the ACC, I hope they stay together. And this is number two on the list. I hope they would stay together in spite of that. And just those two leave. I don't yeah. think that's what's going to happen. though. Yeah, I don't think that'll probably be what happens either. I'm with you, though. That would be the easiest solution for everybody. And that yeah. way you still maintain uh, at least four conferences. Um, uh, but I would the the only ones I would say for I mean, Georgia Tech would be a a hell of a pull, you know, like it's, it's kind of hard, but I'd say, Georgia. But, they, but Georgia tech's going to start caring again. Right. Yeah. Like that's part of their problem is they, they're kind of off in this like void where back in the day, Georgia tech used to super care about their sports. Mm-hmm. And then since things have changed and things have gotten so big, not that they don't, but they don't care to the level that say Clemson. Well, does. they also have an 800 pound gorilla who's always been an 800 pound gorilla that's now flexing their 800 pound gorilla yeah. muscles in Georgia right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to me, Louisville, Miami jump right off the page. Like that would be automatic, I think, if you could Pit bring those West two. Pitt for Virginia. Pitt for West Virginia would be fine. And but they're, they're but cool. for me, again, I would need to do more info right. to really have a solid four. So Louisville, Miami would be like automatic. Like, yes, they take two of the four spots. The other two, between all of the options, I would have to kind of weigh that a bit more. Okay. All right. No, like I said, is there a way they can keep together? I'm going to throw an addendum on this and maybe take a little bit of a left turn. I think one of the other issues I didn't put on here, but I brought it up to Steven Simcox earlier, is for Notre Dame, who's involved in this, but not football-wise, if the ACC breaks up, they need to find a place to park their other sports. I will contend that based on Notre Dame needing autonomy and a little more control over things – Mind you, SMU, Stanford, and Cal are in due in large part to the fact that Notre Dame told the ACC to do it, and they did. They can't necessarily do that in the SEC or the Big Ten. Mm. I would say that the place they would park their other sports would be the Big 12 because they could go in and go, hey, Big 12, we'd like to do the same deal we had with the ACC, and we'd like to, you know, We'd like to throw our weight behind you. And the Big 12 would say yes so fast, Notre Dame couldn't finish the sentence. If Notre Dame was involved, you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so like what I'm saying is the Big 10 and – because if Notre Dame wanted to be in the Big 10 or the SEC, right now this morning they could call up and do it. They could totally call up and do it. Nothing stopping them from doing that at all. And so, you know, uh, so they haven't. And the reason they haven't is their autonomy – I would say that the Big 12 gives them more of that than those other than the Super 2. Yeah. Trademark Craig Smoke did. Yeah, Super 2, trademark me. Um, I, I think you're right as far as if they were forced into a decision like that, that you could still somehow maintain most of your, your independence or your football independence. I also think there's very much a looking down the nose at the Big 12, and that would come from Notre Dame. Uh, and, and I don't know if that would be prohibitive to them wanting to do an alliance of any sort. But, yeah, I mean, if you're the Big 12 on the other end of the phone, you're you're saying yes in, in no time at all. Uh, absolutely. If that were to somehow – that opportunity were to fall on your front porch, then, yeah, you're you're absolutely all in on that. But I don't know. That's that's an interesting part of this, definitely the Notre Dame aspect of uh, that hinges so much on what the AC, what happens with the ACC. But, yeah, if you're Brett Yormark, you better be ready for anything. Would Notre Dame be able to convince Cal and Stanford to hold their nose to be a part of that? 
Would the Big Twelve want them to be a part of I, it? I don't know. Yeah. I don't think that. I don't think they would. I don't think. And so. I don't think they would. There's to enough, your question, there's enough just negativity there and a kind of this yeah. arrogance. There I think that, they would choose some other route. Then yeah. I think they yeah. would choose to go and try to rejoin with Oregon State and Washington State and reignite the pack rather than join the Big Twelve. Yeah, I do too. I do too. Just based on what we've learned, and even talking to those who cover. That area, Garrett Ross. Is that it, Paul? No, uh, no. Oh, that's number kind of, kind number of one. It, how does this affect the Big Twelve? We've been talking about that the yeah, whole time, anyway. Yeah. But they would stand to gain. Like, like I think, I think Louisville would be their first call because I think that's something that would happen. But if you look at it, how like if it went down the basketball list, right? Mm-hmm. It, and I'm taking North Carolina off this thing here because I think that's not what they want. Um, but if you went down the basketball list of we can definitely get Louisville. We can definitely get Pitt. We can probably get Syracuse, and I bet you we can get Duke. Like that's what I would do if I were them. You know, basketball. Why would wise. Duke not have the same feeling about the Big Twelve that you see from Stanford and Cal? Uh, because again, small private school. Same yeah. like and they're not you know, West Coast elitist, like yeah. looking down their nose at the the truck stop and all that BS yeah. that we no, we see like, on ew. from like yeah, very overly dramatic accounts. But uh, yeah, that, I think that that's just they've never been approached about it. For one, it's never mm-hmm. been a realistic thing, really, and. Whereas the the West Coast side, they had the opportunity to pluck from the Big 12, right? And they said, no, we're not interested. You don't fit our culture. And it's just, uh, they wanted Texas. They, you know, there was a time when they were interested in some of the schools, but that fell through. And then another time it fell through. And then here recently, it was made very clear kind of where lines were drawn with the exception of Arizona schools in Colorado and Utah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, how does this affect the Big 12? Uh, there will definitely be shrapnel, and I think that if you're, again, Brett Yormark and crew, you've just got to be ready, but I'd be awfully interested to see kind of the prioritized list of what kind of an order would there be if you had your choice, and you're being realistic, so take North Carolina off the list, but beyond that, what would be ideal? And I think that just kind of depending on how it goes – you don't swallow the whole conference up and you've got a 25, you know, a thing, unless that's just the direction that it goes, you got to be a bit more selective, but I'd be fascinated to see what a list like that looks like. All right. Thank you. Everybody that's been a part of the chat. Just saw another super chat come up uh, from our conversation with Tim Brando. As I mentioned earlier, um, all of you appreciate you every day that you give us whatever time it might be. Please hit the like and subscribe button. If you have not already, or tell somebody else about the show as we continue to grow. We appreciate that. For Garrett Ross, thank you, Garrett. Uh, Levi Carraway, Emery Winter, Jack McKenzie. Uh, Jack is on his way on the road, Paul. Is that right? Jack's going to be on a road yeah, he's trip. He's going to be in Memphis. Memphis covering the Baylor men's basketball team. Obviously, the tournament, the first day. We've seen these games, including two more tonight. The mega day tomorrow. Who's going to be the first? Oh, my God. Look at that. We'll see that. Craig Smoke, Paul Catalina. I'm David Smoke. To all of our sponsors, we continue to grow with you two and them. This is 365 Sports Tonight.